Gabby isn't an insurance company per se, but rather an organized, easy to use, and comprehensive database of other insurance companies' quotes. In going to gabby.com slash sacred, that's G-A-B-I dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D, you're met with a very simple questionnaire that solicits some essential information about your home or auto situations. I have some local mom and pop insurance for my house, but by using Gabby's service, I rapidly realize that I may just be overpaying. In fact, the average Gabby customer saves a staggering $961 per year on average by using their service and jumping over to a different provider that offers identical coverage to what you have. It's a heck of a service, and if you're in the market for auto or home insurance or want to compare and contrast and see what you can save, which is probably a lot, you'll definitely want to check it out. So do so by going to Gabby.com sacred and put your insurance policy to the test like I did. It's free to try and there's no obligation. Again, go to Gabby.com sacred. That's Gabby.com sacred. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 144. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by Chris Raygun. Chris, how are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing yeah. good. It's, it's, another, it's another day in, indoors. It's you another know. day in Seattle, Delson, as you <laughs> playing Delson around. Yeah, I, 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 decided to, I decided to embrace, uh, I was Googling uh, beanie characters, of which there are very many, actually. Yeah. Amanda Spinelli yeah. from Recess comes to mind. Um, Delson Rowe, obviously famous, <laughs> right, <laughs> famous, the, iconic, the world, the world uh, over. Yeah, yeah. iconic uh, uh, video game character, Delson Rowe. I don't know. <laughs> I just I, I'm liking the beanie, man. Like I, it, it feels kind of nice to not That's have to good. worry about how good your hair looks. It's great. I mean, you look great. It's awesome. Uh, you have the the nuclear phone behind you, the mm-hmm. nuclear telephone. Uh, I'm gonna call up Soviet leaders to make sure everything's um, on the up and up, which is good. Yeah, you know, I'm happy about that. We're recording this on April Fool's Day, so you never know what important calls might come through there. You know, I know. <laughs> My God, can you imagine? Like everything has to shut down everywhere. Everyone has to understand this day is ruined for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it sucks. Uh, yeah, it is. It is kind of lame. Uh, also joining us today, as usual, is uh, executive producer of Last Stand Media, Dustin Furman. Dustin, good to see you. You're wearing a Super Mario Brothers 3 this is- yellow box art NES shirt, which I like. It was way overpriced. I feel like an idiot for buying it, but I was getting the, the pin set for free. I was like, now's the time because I'm paying for shipping. But it was like a $30 shirt, which just felt oh, heinous. Fine. I mean, but- you know, I will allow Mario to, you know, abuse me. I mean, he's yeah. dead now, actually, as of uh, as of today. He's no longer alive. He was removed from the store, kicked out of the building yeah. and promptly shot on site. He's gone. Yeah, they got, yes. him, at the, they got him at the toll booth. Riddled. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I they actually got me because I bought that collection on Switch. Nice. I did it at like the last day. Cause I'm like, ah, fuck it. Sons of bitches. And then I bought it because I, I I would like to I love Super Mario Galaxy and obviously Sunshine I have a, a soft spot for as well but it's good to have you here with us Dustin thank you for joining us taking time out of your busy day being a Twitch streamer man with your nice little setup oh I do you know I always never know whether the lights are cool or lame but I think they're cool so I'm going with I it. think they're cool too you look great I mean I'm just in my office nothing really changes oh you know what I do have here this won't be very fun for the um for the audio listeners but that's too bad i i have the uh, first copies of uh habroxia on oh. vita and oh and uh, ps4 right here oh look at that and so nice. there they are isn't that nice isn't that fun so if you ordered habroxia to our newest game lily moe's newest game that i wrote on ps vita or ps4 physically they're going out now people are getting them so thank you for your support if you didn't get them have fun buying them on ebay i <laughs> fucking tried to warn you didn't i i did <laughs> i tried to warn you all right sacred symbols our weekly PlayStation podcast. Oh, Vita, we're going to get them. I'm just, we got to keep it close. We'll we got to know. Right yeah, I know. That, we'll we'll I'm get there. I'm keeping it very close. We, we'll, I'll get there. Uh, but Sacred Symbols is our weekly PlayStation podcast. Last Stand Media is our podcast empire. Of course, you can support us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Last Stand Media, like more than 10,000 of you do. Doing so gets you early ad free access to this show, as well as our Xbox podcast, Defining Duke, which is very popular. Uh, Mr. Matty plays and Carrick slash ACG slash Jeremy. I don't I can't with all the names that he goes by. It's yeah. difficult for me to keep up with it. 
I have to kind of when someone says, you know, it's like, oh, Jeremy, you know, I'm like, wait, Jeremy. Oh, Carrick. Oh, ACG. You know, it's <laughs> That's like, happened oh, to us, Colin, a few times. It's, yeah, it's it's the Trinity. He's well, like the Trinity. When yeah. Defining Duke started, you're like, you said something, something, Jeremy. And I'm like, who the fuck is Jeremy? Because I've <laughs> never referred to him as Jeremy before. And that's like, well, because I send him, you know, I have to send him his money and, you know, his checks and all right. that. So obviously I, I have, I'm, I'm not going to send them to, you know, what is it, Angry Centaur Gaming? I don't think that that's going <laughs> to cash. Maybe that's no. his business's name and it would cash, but maybe. Uh, but nonetheless, they're doing a great job over there. So you get early ad free access to that. Of course, you also get access to my brother. Uh, my brother's uh, knockback podcast that I do with him, which uh, I'm kind of considering it his show. He's the star of the show. We do a retro and nostalgia podcast every week. And we do a, a couple of weekly Patreon exclusive shows, including Sacred Symbols Plus, which is for PlayStation, Defining Duke Ultimate, which is for uh, Xbox. And Sacred Symbols Plus is kind of turning right now into an interview show as I kind of run through a list of people I want to talk to. Last week's conversation, very popular uh, with Nick Calandra, the editor in chief of The Escapist. Uh, I instructed Dustin, well, I instructed, I, I threw it out there because what I like to do is I like to float ideas to Dustin and then make him think that he came up with the idea. Mm. So what I said was, <laughs> hey, Dustin, I sent him an email and I'm like, hey, Dustin, what do you, you know, I think we should, you know, or what do you think about making that episode free for everyone? And then, and then Dustin's gonna be like, oh, we should make that episode free for everyone. I'll be like, you can take credit for that. Dustin, I, I set that little seed for you. So I think we will make that episode free. It was all about games media and the future of games media. And then um, we're going to have our boy Dick Hogue back on next Ooh. uh next next week Dick uh richard hogg uh richard hogg rather i'm sorry who is the lawyer our lawyer friend from the midwest we had him on not too long ago actually to talk about some other things but i sent him this email and uh i wanted to, so i wanted to do an episode with him about certain thing like legalities going on right now in the industry mm. so we're going to talk about cd project and their legal liability for cyberpunk we're going to talk about defamation and libel in terms of Troy Levitt uh, at Avalanche and other defamatory things that have happened around the industry, um, such as what happened to N Nolan Bushnell and all that shit a couple of years ago. And then we're going to talk about corporate consolidation. So like all these companies buying each other, we're going to talk about that in a little while. And um, then we're going to talk about licensing in light of the news we're going to talk about in a little while with PlayStation 3 and Vita going offline. We're going to talk about like what it is you buy when you get a license and what our expectations should be about access to those licenses. So that's going to be an awesome episode if you're a nerd like I am and a lot of our audience is. Yeah. So thank you so much for that, that support. Now, before I move on, I did want to talk quickly about a correction that we had from the audience. Kyler Schatz wrote into us. He said, quick correction from last week's episode, which I believe was also discussed on the episode before. He's right. He says, Call of Duty League is played on PC with controller, not on PlayStation consoles. So I looked this up because we mentioned that, you know, Sony like kind of has a buy in with the the um, the Call of Duty League. Activision laid off a bunch of people from that. There's some sort of effect. And I'm like, where did I get this idea from that the game ran on PlayStation? So I looked it up. Well, starting this year, it's running on PC. Mm -hmm. But when it was founded, 2019, played on standard PlayStation 4 consoles. Uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. So I knew I didn't make that up completely, but you're right. That isn't true anymore. Mm. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I wouldn't have known um, that at all. Yeah, that, that you know, want to correct the record. We also have to correct the record about something else. I want to throw it over to Dustin for this one. So we have a great merch store. It's doing awesome. LastStandMedia.shop. Um, it's made, you know, manufactured in America, made in America, shipped in America and all that, except for we found out one thing about one product from one user. And so we wanted to shine light on this uh, to better represent the product. So, uh, Dustin, do you want to kick in on this? Right. Yeah. It came to our attention that the so most of our shirts, there's two options. There's like a normal and there's a premium. Uh, the normal shirts are made in India. Like there's a tag on side that says made in India, but um, we got a lot of clarification about what that means in that specifically like the shirt was designed the, the, as far as like the dimensions and the cut and stuff like that. Um, and it specifically was sourced and made for our merch provider. Um, so, and that's really just a way that they can offer a shirt for a lower price than the premium shirt. Um, so we wanted to be upfront with that uh, to the audience that that is you know, out there just because we've been hailing the uh, made in America aspect it is still based on like legal definitions manufactured because it's like they manufacture the shirt. They source the clothing for that mm -hmm. specific product from India. But 
uh, we were he told us about the the really relationship he has with this particular company that it's all uh, union labor, which is ironic because we we talk about union stuff here in a different light. But I don't know what union labor necessarily means in India, but we're uh, it's not just like, a you know, slave labor Chinese that we've talked about in the past. Uh, he has a very specific relationship with the guy that owns this factory. He said that it's like all women that run and cut and sew and make these products. So we wanted to be clear and upfront about that um, just because that was new information that was brought to our attention. Yeah, was that, that was clear. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's kind of what I want from the audience. You don't have to let us know on Patreon, but you can just tweet at us or whatever. Tweet at Last Day Media or whatever. Is like, because I was thinking about this. I'm like, okay, everything else is totally made in America on the store. Right. Including the premium shirts, the sweatshirts, everything, the masks, the stickers and everything. Yeah. Except for this. And I was like, okay, well, we weren't aware of this. We could easily just remove this from the store. Um, that's and enough. it probably wouldn't affect most customers, but it does remove the lower cost option for people that are more cost constrained. And so I guess what I want to do is kind of give as long as it's fair trade, which it is, um, that's kind of the most important thing. I'd prefer it be domestic uh, completely. Uh, that's important to me. So the audience can let us know because we can easily take this shirt down or wait for there to be an all American solution until we offer us a lower price T-shirt option. But it was important for us to kind of bring that to, to our attention because we've sold a lot of merch, um, like a lot. And one person has brought this up so far. But when it was brought up, we were like, oh, well, we didn't really understand that. So then we investigated what that meant and we needed to relay a word to the audience. So we're at laststandmedia.shop. We're super happy with the quality of the merch and all of that. People are really digging it. But if Made in America is kind of like really important to you, like it is to me, then you might just want to avoid that one product. And if we find out anything is kind of, you know, not like we, we make fun of China all the time, but we don't want, our, we don't want to, it's impossible to not participate in a global trade market that takes advantage of ill paid labor. It's not possible unless you like mm -hmm. live totally off the grid and you like source your, your electronics in some weird way and all that. So I'm not saying that we would ever want to do that, but in ways that we can reasonably control, we want to be able to contribute to a more equitable outcome for our own country's workforce. And we certainly want to do it while helping the underpaid and under labored, uh, underpaid labor rather in countries that don't treat their people very well. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important. Yeah. So give us feedback. But we wanted to say that at the top. No that's doubt. fair. All right. Let me throw this one over to you, Chris. Alex Bolton wrote into us. Say, good evening, gentlemen. How are we all doing now that we've been in this pandemic lockdown for over a year? Just a little gut check as I feel that time has just flown by for me. So much has happened in my life during all this, yet it feels like a total blink of an eye. God bless. I mean, we've talked about this many times, Chris, the, the sort of time vortex. But I'm wondering, I'm feeling pretty optimistic right now, actually. I'm feeling like things are getting better here in Virginia. Things are pretty normal i mean obviously people are still getting sick people are still dying we don't want that to be the new normal mm -hmm. but shit i mean i was talking to micah when i was reading the news last night and un it's unfortunate because we have so many european listeners shit's going off in europe like it's totally different there right now it's really bad uh, except for in england i think they're doing pretty well and in other in certain other places yeah, yeah. Uh, poland maybe but here in the u.s at least in virginia in the, in the mid-south it's pretty normal so i'm feeling pretty good how are you feeling now yeah, I mean, the, the issue with America is that it's just so huge, you know, like mm. uh, there could be in t there could be like millions of people doing fine and still like it wouldn't even <laughs> it wouldn't even make a dent into like what the broader population could be put could be going through. But I don't know. It's it's I'm feeling optimistic in the sense that I think it, because these uh, vaccines are, are kind of starting to be more reliably administered, even though they're not technically actually vaccines they're not fda approved because there's not enough time to for the fda to approve it it's more like a flu shot from what i from what i'm hearing but i don't know like i i, I tend to stay in the realm of like uh you know what i'm just gonna expect the worst to hope for the best so that way like you know i can be pleasantly surprised if things ever go back to normal or if things are still the worst i can at least be like hey you know i was right <laughs> Is kind of how yeah, I look well, at it. Got to find yeah, some kernel of uh, some silver lining, you know. 
you get that smug satisfaction. Yeah. You know, yeah. you were right. Uh, unfortunately, sadly, you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I mean, I think I'm just, I think that my lifestyle, it was so unaffected by this, like profoundly unaffected by this mm-hmm. actually that it's, easy for me to also kind of like the, the hill was like a little smaller for me it was just like a, it was like a nipple let's say on the body <laughs> it wasn't like a big mountain you know it was like oh, a little nipple yeah, so it yeah. wasn't like it wasn't that different for me but but dustin how, how are you how are you feeling what's your mental fortitude so what's your state right now your constitution yeah. so i actually it's funny i was talking about this with my my parents are here for easter this weekend which is awesome so we've been hanging out but and i wanted to toss this to chris too because chris and i are the same age mm-hmm. and i think that you know, your age is a big factor on how this pandemic has affected you. And it's different, not necessarily better or worse. Like if you were a senior in high school in March 2020, that is a huge, huge impact. So yeah. I don't take this as me trying to diminish another. I'm just my own perspective. I feel like being 27 has been an odd age for this to happen mm-hmm. because 27 is like solid late 20s. And it's like this kind of transition where it's like, okay, the, I mean, Chris and I, we've been adults for a while now, right? But we're no longer new adults. We're no longer mid twenties. We are late twenties and it, life has a bit of a different quality to it, to me. And it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just the things that were, uh, the dilation of time is starting to feel very weird, especially with with COVID. Things that are that feel like uh, a year ago were actually five years ago. Yeah. And no, you weren't. You weren't. A, it feels like you were, you know, nineteen or twenty just recently, but it's not. You were nineteen or twenty seven or eight years ago. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, as I said. Chris, it's, can you relate to this? What no, I'm saying? No, totally. I feel like 21 was like a few weeks ago. You know, right? Like sincerely, like, and I think that's largely, um, honestly, in, in my situation, it's it's kind of exemplified just because, you know, I got out of my parents' house like really, really like at, at 21, and I found pretty, and I don't want to say immediate success, but I, I was I was able to like kind of like live on my own comfortably like a lot earlier than a lot of people. So my life has been like basically the same since I was 21. And maybe like when I was 21 or 22, I was living more of a a 27 year old existence than I thought I was. But you know what I mean? Like this the stability and just like the fact that it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm actually comfortable. Well, well it's like a lot of people around me are like, you know, the, I got college debt. I got like this. And it's like, oh, shit. You know, um, so it's it's a very weird kind of feeling. But yeah, I'm at that point where it's like, oh, man, like I, I, sh- I got to start thinking like like I'm going to be old soon. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to I, gotta st- Which, I can't be th- I can't be uh, thinking about the shit that I was thinking about when I was 22, you know. Right. And I know I can already I can I can feel your comment right now saying like 27 you're still you're still young it's I like know, that's yeah. not the point the point is not that i'm saying oh chris and i are old now it's just um you know and i think it's a very real phenomenon the older you get your your dilation of time because you've been alive longer is different and yeah. so with covid uh, you know a year that has been mostly spent not going out and creating major memories really has a weird flavor to all that all at yeah, once no, totally so I think 26 is like firmly in in the area where like you're kind of okay to still be kind of dicking around. But like Mm -hmm. the fact that 20 the fact that that final year of like your mid 20s is just gone. And now you've just kind of been fast forwarded into the point where you're like, you're going to be 30 soon. (laughs) You know, it's really like uh, I'm as far as I'm concerned, I've uh, I'm still 26 at this point because I didn't get my 26. Right. So that's how I'm living. I don't care. I'm probably going to, I'm knowing my luck. I'm probably going to live a long time, which sucks, but you know, whatever. <laughs> well, I'll be all right. It's a pretty uplifting conversation. That was just, <laughs> that just occurred here. And uh, I'm just saying, I don't want to be like 90 years old and like walking around on like a half spider butt. Actually, that sounds awesome. Like a half spider body. Like, like a dark mall or something yeah. like that. Whoa. Um, well, I mean, I had a conversation with Chris not too long ago. We had like a personal kind of back and forth as we sometimes Mm -hmm. do and one piece of advice i gave to chris was just that he's so and i feel this way about dustin too although dustin has 
had the advantage of not being in California and thus being able to plant roots and and kind of make the pot what I would look at as positive and wise moves to get done as quickly as possible. And what I was saying to Chris was he's in such a great and fortuitous position in his life that he should forego the let's say the the carnal pleasures of California Mm -hmm. and just plant roots in New York and buy a house and just save money and pay off the property and have no debt at all. And like by the time you, I was telling him, but by the time you are my age, you're going to be fucking golden. And then I was like, you can go to California twice a month if you want mm-hmm. and still save money yeah. in that, in that situation. So I feel like my, my whole, my advice to people as they get older is like, cause my, it's easy for me to say, I like ticked off my, I had a great twenties, but mm-hmm. I eventually learned, I mean, I was always very wise with money and prudent and all of that, but, I wish I made this move much quicker because there was no reason not to other than paying someone else's mortgage and like, you know, doing whatever it was just, you know, it's just, it's just strange. So, but you guys are younger and I, when I look at my sons, I, I see glimmers in my own eye and my own past. Hmm. So, uh, I, I wish you guys the best in your own endeavors. And I do want to throw this little piece of information into the, into the works here. Nathan Favreau wrote in, this is unexpected. He says, hey, Colin, I saw on Twitter you have a new workout bench. Are you planning on taking your workouts to the next level? Should we prepare ourselves for a new swole, Colin? So I'm now. I obsessively do my cardio workout every day to maintain my weight, but then I bought a weight table and just two like, I don't know what you would call them, like modular 50 pound weights where you take little dumbbells on and off in the water. And I can't lift, you know, I can't like, you know, lift over my head 50 pounds, probably like more than once, but I have them each like 15 or 20 pounds and I'm doing like different kinds of workouts with them for the first time ever. I've never weight trained in any regard in my entire life. And so, yes, I, I am planning on giving you a new swole Colin for no other reason than I can do it for no other reason hmm. than I'm going to. I feel like so powerful right now. After only a few days, I feel like I can punch right through the screen, punch Dustin right in his gullet. You wouldn't Whoa. even know what hit him. Gullet. You know? Yeah, that's a fatal area to be hit. punched. You wouldn't even know what hit you. No, that's how powerful Definitely I feel not. right now. No. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone Ratchet and Clank is still free and it now runs at 60 frames a second. We're going to talk about it in a little while, but it runs on 60 frames on PS5. Dante Almo wrote into us and says it's completely wild that some people on Twitter still don't know Ratchet and Clank is free. How is it that people who supposedly own PlayStation consoles and are invested in this ecosystem don't know when free content is available? Is it Sony's marketing? Is it because these deals are only advertised maybe once? It just does not make any sense. Anyways, thanks for all that you guys do. So again, Ratchet is free. They did just release a 60 frames on PS5 patch, which is unfortunate for me because I just platinum the game. So fuck me. But I feel like, Chris, the reason people don't know is because have you ever used the PlayStation Store before? Mm-hmm. Like, it's terrible. Can you find <laughs> anything you're looking for on the PlayStation Store without literally searching for the specific name? I don't even know what's going on on the PS5's PlayStation Store. It's like it's you kind of settle into it a little bit, but it's so there's too many layers. That's the problem with PS5. There are too many layers. And so it's, it's not a huge surprise to me that the, the people don't know that Ratchet is free. It's a bit obtuse, like the way it's designed. Like it feels like there's like a there's there's like little nest eggs of like of like specific content. But you have to like know exactly what you're you have to know literally like exactly what you're looking for. And then you got to find what Sony thinks that means <laughs> it's very bizarre like um i was looking for uh i was looking for odd world uh and you know i thought it would i thought it would be like in like oh you know uh, up and coming and it's and it's like oh it's not or like or just announced or, or like uh recently released or like upcoming and it's just and it's just not i just had to look i, had to, I just had to search odd world and i was just like all right now i found it after and it wasn't even the first <laughs> result on the ps5 store so it's like i don't it's it's a mess man they 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 don't they definitely don't integrate their announcements well into the into the um into the ui and in fairness i don't know if any platform particularly does this well um i i find myself being consistently out of the loop every time i log into anything um in fact, the only things that I feel like are good about it are video games themselves. Like, mm. you know, whenever you log on to Destiny or like or like something, it's like some pop up being like, this is free. This is a new thing. Have you done this? And it's like, OK, yeah, I, feel the same way. I complained about that with the division recently, too, where it's 
it's overwhelming. It made me not want to play the game. I was yeah, like, exactly. oh, I'm really amped up to get back into the division. I'm like, I don't want to fucking do this. Uh, so go check it out. We'll talk about Ratchet in a moment. I want to hold that thought, though. Yeah. Uh, just a few more small pieces of news here. PAX East canceled officially. Um, frankly, fuck them. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but PAX Online is running July 15th through 18th. Uh, if you're interested in that, Tokyo Game Show also canceled this year. That usually happens in September in Tokyo or outside of Tokyo. And the Tokyo Game Show Online is still happening. That event will be September 30th to October 3rd. There is a weird I didn't even know how to cook talk about this, but Cooking Mama Cookstar. Do you guys remember this the saga around this game? So this game was substantial for some reason because it was going to be the first Cooking Mama game that come came to PlayStation. Obviously, this is a a kind of a more modest and uh, casual title for DS and Wii and all this kind of stuff. So it was substantial because it was going to come to PlayStation. But then you guys might recall that even when it came to Switch, it was like some unauthorized thing and then it was taken down and it's it wasn't for sale for a while and all this weird shit happened. And then the company that owns Cooking Mama was like, you have no permission to even put the game on PlayStation. And it was this whole people can go read about it. And then out of nowhere, the game just appeared on PlayStation Network a couple of days ago. No press release, nothing anywhere. The game just appeared. The trophies appeared. It's for sale right now. Cooking Mama Cookstar. So after all the lawsuits and weird kind of stuff, it just kind of they just shit it out. So if you guys remember that saga, which was weird, then you'll be glad to know the game's available for you to buy. You know, I, I can't believe that was a year ago. Yeah, that's insane. What the hell's going on? We're dying. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And uh. <laughs> also, I wanted to bring attention to a story we make fun of kotaku all the time we just you know they deserve it but there is an interview on kotaku that was conducted around dreams and media molecule and these guys are getting a lot of um a lot of attention lately we talked about siobhan ready getting who's the director of the studio getting uh, a bafta fellowship which is a huge deal there's only 11 people in games that have ever gotten one and they also did an interview with abby hep who's um used to work at respawn and is their i guess live product lead but she used to be like a community manager and stuff and so it gives a little bit of insight if you guys are interested because we're really hard on dreams it gives a little bit of insight into what's going on at that studio and what they're trying to do and all that but i must also criticize the article because it does not get into the meat and the grit of who is playing this game how many people are playing it because they're always talking about what people are doing in the game and how people are enjoying it but they never I don't know if it's because the journalists didn't get the answer. They didn't ask the questions, but it doesn't quite get to the meat. But we're starting to get a better idea of what's going on in this studio. And I feel like this is an important piece of the puzzle. So I wanted to recommend it. And finally, before we get into what we're playing, moms like me wrote in and said, would you eat someone else's booger for one thousand dollars? Dustin. There needs to be more information. Do we know (laughs) the origin of the booger? A nose. (laughs) Whose nose? Well, yeah, I, I, that, someone, that's the else. Thing, someone else's booger. So I, my, my vision for this is that you just are presented a booger that yeah. isn't yours. Yeah, it's like you, on a plate. all you're told is that it's human. Yeah, like a plate, right? Like a small like a saucer, plate, a booger. Yeah, I know, you're said all you're told is this is a human booger from someone from someone's nose. There's a wide variety of types. That mm-hmm. is true. You know, it might be dry, a little, little crispy. It might be. Would, a, would you want it that way? Oh, dude, you could practically just inhale that. You wouldn't even notice. Right. And then, honestly, if it's like that, then $1,000, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't know if I could truly make this decision until it was presented in front of me. I'm, I'm saying that nine times, 99 out of 100 times, I would say no. Right. But if it's, if it's real small and it's just a tiny little, little boy... Like I said, just you could breathe it. That's the that's the thing too. It's like you don't even know the size. Of, this thing could be like a hulking, you know. This thing could, this thing could be like uniquely enormous, hmm. you know. For all you know, hmm. I wouldn't do it for a thousand dollars. There's, um, I I don't know if there is a price that limits, like um, it would have to be several hundreds of thousands, really, for me to kill. hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes, yes. Huh. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit surprised that your guys, I don't know if it's the right word, but kind of almost a prudishness because 
if you just gave me a, like a saucer, like a tea saucer with someone's booger on it and you're like, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars cash if you eat that. I'm eating that booger. I mean, like, straight <laughs> up, I'm eating that booger. A thousand dollars. I mean, I'm not hard up. See, you can give me a thousand dollars. It's like, OK, I'll take a fucking thousand dollars. You know, that's you know, I'll put that. I'll just go. I'll go buy a, a five year CD with that thousand dollars. I'll have me one thousand fifty dollars in five years. What do you think of that? Oh, yeah. You know? The way I see it is like if <clears throat> the way this always comes down to, to me and I get that I'm in a unique position here. But like if somebody came to me, it's like, would you do this heinous thing for a thousand dollars? I could just make a shirt that says. I did this for a thousand dollars that whatever heinous activity is and probably just make that money and like ways raise awareness of the brand, you know? Mm. So like, to me, it's like, if, if I can just find an easy way to make that money without doing the thing, I would just rather just do that, you know, unless, unless we're talking like literally hundreds of, cause that's like harder to come by, obviously. Cause it's hundreds of thousands of dollars in which case, right. yeah, maybe I would have to get a good look at it. Yeah, you would need a benefactor. Like, who's the benefactor, right? I mean, because yeah, what yeah. I'm thinking of also, it gets a little heinous because it's like, okay, would you would eat, I would eat a booger for a thousand dollars, but would you therefore eat if you had to get a booger without for a thousand dollars? Would you eat a hundred boogers to get a hundred thousand dollars? And the only way you can get them was to eat a hundred boogers. See, that's when it gets a little crazier mm. and. I don't know. I don't know the. I'd like to think that I do almost anything legal for money. So, <laughs> right. Uh, that's, really, that's fair. I uh, what? Say what you need to say, Dustin. I know. I'm just saying that this this concept of the hundred boogers for a hundred thousand is blowing yeah. my mind now because that's like yeah. that's life changing that. money right there. Right. You yeah, just that suffer is. for that for what? How long would it take you to realistically? A hundred, like, it, like you would have softer. to, you would well, have to, like, you know, like when you have crumbs on the plate and you want them, so you have to gather them, gotta, and like a little, you know, you, you yeah. have to do that, and you gotta, oh. you know, and you gotta just scoop it in and eat them. But Idea. there's a big, there's a big factor here too, is that like this is a human booger in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's why I said you might, you might very well die from this. <laughs> That's true. And now that's you just really have a thousand dollars that's just going right to some insurance company to yeah, keep you on dialysis point. until you fucking pass <laughs> away into the fucking ether because you ate a booger for a grand. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you ruined my idea. Because well, I was yeah, going to say, if we're doing the hundred boogers, I was like, you could just like come like make a mega booger, just like that's and worse. Then just, no, then you just you don't well, have you to bite you into it like an orange. Use water, you know, put it back. I, I think you're orange. underestimating the size of a hundred boogers. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that is a good question. That is potentially like an orange. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, and some of, them are, a some of them, some of them, can be bloody. You know? Yeah. yeah you like, don't know. Here's the thing. I want to be very clear. You don't know bloody. the consistency of the booger. You don't know the person's COVID status or other disease status. You know, way worse things out there than COVID you can get from someone's snot. That's true. Roll the dice. Roll the dice, my friends. But the the here's the thing: the hundred boogers for a hundred thousand dollars. This is the whole beef versus like, like, you know, uh, like when they say like you're more likely to get uh, a beef born illness from chopped meat than you are from a piece of steak because it's only one cow as opposed to many. So you're increasing the likelihood that you're going to make more money, but you're also increasing the likelihood of your exposure. So it's all it's like a game of deal or no deal. Mm -hmm. But instead of beautiful women with suitcases, you're eating boogers off of a tea, a tea plate. Someone is vomiting <laughs> in their car right now. Yeah. <laughs> Please write in and let us know how you're doing. All right. I'm a very anxious person by nature, so I totally get it when someone says that they're nervous or unable to sleep because of some concern they have or whatever else. That's life for me, like it is for too many people. But it doesn't have to be that way. And when I discovered Feel CBD, I realized there was much more I could be doing to keep myself calm, measured, focused, rested, and much more in my everyday life. Here's the rub. Feel CBD, which can be found by going to feels.com slash symbols, that's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S, is an all-natural tincture made from the marijuana plant. But CBD, cannabidiol, isn't like its THC cousin in that it doesn't get you stoned, nor is it illegal. Instead, it soothes, calms, and helps keep things metered all without getting high. And as someone who has used feels countless times, I can tell you that it really, truly works. And it's not just limited to helping what ails me, either. Yes, it's helped me find my rest on sleepless nights or calmed my frayed nerves after something set me off, but it can also help you if you're plagued by physical aches and pains. So it's for far more than just anxiety and sleep. 
And while navigating the world of CBD can be scary, it isn't with feels. They have a free human-run hotline with people ready to talk to you about their products, what will work best for you, and more. And you can even become a Feels member so you can get automatic shipments of their CBD without having to worry about running out. When it arrives, you'll see how easy it is to take. Simply put a few drops under your tongue, wait a bit, and voila, you'll be feeling better. It's all so easy that it becomes second nature. If I can do it, you certainly can too. So give Feels a try and see what it can do for you. Go to feels.com slash symbols to get going. Find the product that's right for you. Speak with someone if you need some help and become a member. Again, head to feels.com slash symbols to become a Feels member and finally alleviate yourself of stress, anxiety, sleeplessness, and more. That's feels.com slash symbols. Let's get into what we're playing. Please. Chris, we'll start with you because you're the easy one here this week. It says that you were uh, confused and thought Oddworld came out today. Of yeah, course, you w- foolish son of a bitch. It comes out next week. I know. I was I was so sad because I was like, I have a lot of work to do and obviously nothing on the PlayStation Store is speaking to me right now. I don't have that much of a pull to go into the backlog. But I remember uh, I remember either on this show or like on Twitter, I saw something like, um, oh, Oddworld is like free for April. So for whatever right. reason, I just didn't think about it much. And I was like, oh, that must be like. April 1st like the same you know whenever the whenever the month flips over I just assumed and I was a damn fool because I woke up early today excited (laughs) to play Oddworld and I was like it's coming out in five days you idiot and I was like all right well and I was just looking through all the other games I was playing I was like I've already talked about all these already there's not much I can say other than like anything I've already said so um I'm still playing some stuff I'm still playing like um I'm actually uh, jumping back. I, for some reason, I stopped Shadow of the Colossus remake at the final Colossus. So I'm like, I'm going to just like knock that out. Um, is it because I, that's final Colossus is not fun? That probably is a, a part of a big part of the reason. <laughs> it's not that it's that. I don't think it's not fun. Um, it's definitely not as interesting as the other Colossi or Colossus is no, Colossus. Col- yeah, Colossi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But. You know, I, I just stopped because I thought, like, I proved myself. I could do this, yeah. And then, <laughs> and you came then, far enough. Yeah, but, like, I should just, you know, just finish it. But other than that, I've been waiting for Oddworld because that's the one I really want to, you know, make space in my mind for and sink my teeth into. Because I know it's, like, one of those games, like, I love Oddworld, but it's also, that's a genre of game that I'm not necessarily super into nowadays. Like, the whole, like, you know non-combat oriented 2d like i love combat and like fast and you know frenetic gameplay so even though i do love odd world i can tell it's going to be like a, a little bit of an acclamation game so i'm trying to like free my mental uh my mental your, planescape so i can get your used ba- to it. your bandwidth yeah exactly as it were so i can get ready well, in the to meantime while you're freeing in. yourself you can get mikhail gorbachev on the red phone behind you and you guys can talk about all sorts of interesting things while you're odd waiting world. for odd world to come out i wonder if he's a fan I don't know. Who gives a shit? (laughs) Dustin, what are you playing? So this is not a PlayStation game, but it was so unique. I have to shout it out. I'd have to imagine it's going to come to PlayStation. That is Phasmophobia. This has been a hit on Twitch, and Mm -hmm. it's such a unique game. I've never played anything like it. You're ghost hunters. You go into a location, and your goal is to figure out what type of ghost is there. And so you have all these different instruments so it's almost like it's like, OK, the ghost isn't reacting to this tool, so it can't be this. Hmm. Um, but where it gets really unique in that it uses voice recognition to and so you can talk to the ghost. It'll give you the name of the ghost. And so you'll be like, Jerry, are you there? And then like something might move in the room. You have like five minutes. And then after that, the ghost gets aggroed and starts hunting people. So. A pretty interesting gameplay dynamics in this game. Hmm. I have to imagine with its success on on Twitch and on Steam that they're eventually going to release this on PlayStation. It's definitely very early access. Yeah. Uh, but I've never played anything quite like it, so I had to had to shout it out. It's a it's an interesting game. If you have a lower end PC, I'm imagining you'd be able to to play it. But pretty neat. And. I checked out the Ratchet and Clank 60 FPS update. I was going to I was like, let me just test the waters. Maybe I will do a full playthrough again before uh, the full the new game comes out. And guys, it's very good. It is. It just feels like how it was supposed to feel Uh, Mm -hmm. super smooth. It just I always 
I tell people this and I, I know it doesn't ring true for everybody, but I sincerely believe that because of the responsiveness you get from higher frame rate in 60 FPS, I think it makes games more fun. Like they feel more fun to play. And that I felt that when I was checking out this Ratchet and Clank update. So it's available if you have a PlayStation 5. Available now, which is weird because when they announced it, they said sometime in April. And then literally the next day, they said, here it is. And just shat it out for you to enjoy. It's like an old-fashioned Sony organization. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You you definitely wouldn't want to have that patch ready when you made the game free. No. Yeah. You would want to get a bunch of people to play it and then and then announce the patch a month later. So when people go and they went and played it, even though they're appreciative of the free game, they're like, well, why did. Why did you not just tell me to wait into, you know, it is weird. Well, well I don't know. Very strange indeed. <sighs> indeed. Um, Dustin, I'm a little surprised you didn't put another game in here because I thought I saw that you were streaming outriders right and i wanted to ask you about this game we actually had a letter from the audience and i didn't include it because they were asking if any of us were playing it so sorry out there to you but uh i wanted to get i was very curious about your take on it specifically because i heard it could be a game i can play oh by myself and i heard that it was um micah was saying that she had read that it was very gears of war like which is very attractive to me yeah Uh, so talk to me a little bit about this game from your experience because i thought you and ben were streaming it uh, so that was Maddie and I attempted. Oh, Maddie and you. I'm sorry. We attempted, Maddie. but we had uh, cross play just did not work, oh, um, which shocking. I do have to properly disclose uh, per my providing of the code was from Square Enix dudes for ham radio related. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, we don't stream. request codes on this show. Right. Yeah. So that was all ham radio related to be clear, <laughs> but it was provided by Square Enix. But I didn't put it on here because. My impression of the game is not fair to it because I had such a horrible experience just trying to play it yesterday, which maybe that is worth sharing is that the cross play did not work at all. I was on PC and Maddie was on Series X and we could not get it to work. But uh, Colin, I actually do. Now that you mentioned, I actually think this would be a game that is completely up your alley and that uh, very Gears of War-esque. You can see a lot of that DNA since I believe... Yeah, people, people can, can fly. fly. Made, mm-hmm. They made judgment. Right. Yeah. yeah, so there's like exploding headshots and and stuff like that and the running when you run from cover to cover. But And it has that, uh, that looter shooter, the schluter aspect to it that you uh you also like. And pow- yeah. the powers are pretty cool too. Like I'm... I picked the... Uh, the pyro the pyromancer and so like you can like bring up walls of flames and then like catch people on fire they shoot up in the air and explode they shoot up into the air they (laughs) shoot up in the air and they explode (laughs) so yeah uh, i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna check it out because i just i was making fun of so uh, mike and i were just going through the playstation store trying to navigate see what's out and you know marvel at the nothingness that's coming to playstation 5 but and by the way, just a quick, I'm really griping today, but well, it's going to be a gripey episode. I'm just letting you know. Uh, yeah. I go to the PlayStation store and look at like, what's the, what are the new releases? And then it shows you an entire like 20 selections of pre-orders before it even shows you like what the games are. And then it's like, oh, this is just announced, but now it's out and this was just announced, but it's a pre-order. And I, I don't understand what's going on in the store, but I went and I watched some of the trailers and I was like, making fun of it because it really is corny as shit. Like the whole, like they're like, got their backs to each other and it's like this whole i just can't stand like the same thing it's just the same these indistinguishable video game pieces that come in and out but the gameplay looked really fun and that's all i really care about so i think i'm going to check it out although i am distracted right now by wild arms 3 which i announced last week i was i was playing wild arms 3 is a 2003 playstation 2 role playing game i'm playing it because as people will remember there was a time when sony was trying to um mess around with the idea of bringing some of their classic games to PlayStation 4. So um, so I'm playing it and I, I, you know, when you get far in a game and you're like, all right, I've given the game so much. We kind of talked about this with Dragon Quest 11, although I don't want to compare them because I actually do like Dragon Quest 11. Uh, You get so far into a game and you're like, all right, well, I've come this far. And then and then that becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because you 
start realizing like, oh, now I've given this game 40 hours and now I'm 40 hours away from the end. Or I've given, you know, and so on. So I'm getting more and more trapped in this game. And it just is so tedious. And yet I just won't stop playing it. I play it every day, trying to get like further and further into it. And every time I play it, I'm just like, I don't. I just wrote down some things here like the grinding is we I love grinding and role playing games, but the grinding is really unsatisfying. The writing is really bad. The translations are super strange. And this is weird because Wild Arms one and two were both well written and well translated. Um, And, you know, I have a really hard time when when games introduce new mechanics like halfway through a game, they do this in a really bad way. They introduce like this tank that you have to like upgrade and drive around the map. And I'm like, what the fuck? Is so now I'm like playing like Blaster Master or something. And then I just wrote like the dungeons all feel the same. The camera's too tight on the characters. The equipment system's boring. It, it's vague. And it exemplifies. I, the reason I wanted to say that is because it exemplifies why I don't like PlayStation 2 role playing games. It just there's something about this era that seems so gray and boring and drab and monotonous to me. And mm-hmm. Wild Arms 3, sadly, I want I'm going to see it through to the end. In fact, I'm going to platinum this game uh, out of respect to media vision, the developer, because I do love media vision. But I don't I remember. And I think I said this last week that I was kind of quickly recalling why I play. I didn't beat this game when I was a kid. Like yeah. I came out when I was a freshman in college. I, I remembered why I was like, oh, I, I used to very quickly put games down all the time when I was young. If I, it didn't speak to me. And yeah. So I'm playing it. I don't recommend it. I, I would love to hear from people that have played it in the past, like what you might like about it. Because what I was surprised was that on Metacritic, it's like in the, the mid to high 70s. It's not it's not ill received. And I don't understand. I don't I don't get it. So I, I, I might get into the Outriders and kind of like in tandem with this game because there's still not much else to play until. Yeah. You know, we're in Returnal month now. That's so right. We're only, uh, we're only a few weeks away, which is exciting. All right. So I said that this was going to be a gripey episode and it's going to be and it already has been because of a major piece of news that we've talked about in the past, but has been confirmed. So let's just jump right into this and talk. Number one, the rumors are true. Sony is shutting down the PlayStation Store for PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita and eliminating any legacy store access PlayStation Portable had as well. As for as for first reported last week by website, The Gamer, which accurately noted the store closures would happen this summer. Sony sent both developers and players alike letters announcing the news. Here's the essential information. On July 2nd, the PlayStation Store for PlayStation 3 will be taken offline. It was first put online in November of 2006 and will have run continuously for 15 years. PSP's PlayStation Store will also be taken down at this point, though Sony is quick to point out, rightly so, that PSP's version of the PlayStation Store was ostensibly neutered back in 2016. So this isn't huge news. Perhaps the biggest and saddest piece of news of all, however, is that on August 27th, PlayStation Vita's PlayStation Store will go offline. First opened in December of 2011, Vita's storefront will be killed just shy of its decade mark. Up to these respective dates, you can purchase anything you want on these versions of the PlayStation Store, and you will have access to them later, so you can re-download games you already own even after those dates come and go. You will simply be stopped from buying anything beginning July 2nd on PS3 and PSP and August 27th on Vita. Sony hasn't commented or I'm sorry, committed to how long we'll be able to download what we've purchased, though it's fairly safe to assume that this functionality will exist in perpetuity. On the development side, if you're curious, we got separate letters that outline some more information. PlayStation 3 content must be submitted to Sony by May 24th and must be published to the store by June 1st. Vita content must be submitted by July 12th. and can be purchased no later than July 20th or published. I'm sorry, no later than July 20th. Dustin, how are you feeling? Well, I'm last week we talked about this and I think the overwhelming, the, the overall take was this is definitely going to happen, but there's no way Sony would be this irresponsible and do it this soon. Well, here we are. (laughs) And, uh, Sony, I mean, here's the thing, guys, we always are like, Sony wouldn't do that, but Sony does have a record of doing things like that. But we just tell ourselves it's like, they couldn't possibly, do that and here we are um and yeah it's a difficult thing to navigate in that i get it especially with like ps3 and and psp i'm i'm very at peace with that because in some ways i'm like yeah you can't keep these stores open forever um 
Mm -hmm. Obviously, we would like a backwards compatibility solution instead, but it's clear that Sony's not interested in that. I think the bigger blow, as you mentioned, Colin, is the Vita, uh, especially, and I'll let you get into this, but the fact that uh, they did not tell anyone who's working on Vita games that this was happening, and that is just simply unacceptable uh, because this goes beyond Lilymo. There are other teams that we've seen articles laid out uh, throughout this week of people talking about the developers that are working on Vita games that are just shit out of luck. Now, any money or time or whatever, which time is money when in development that you've invested is just gone. They, you know, Sony, they do not give a fuck. It's done. It's over. So it should have been more time, clearly. But yeah, how do you feel, Chris? It's wildly irresponsible. <laughs> like it's uh, just it speaks to um, this is I, I don't know if negligence or incompetence or, or what, but this is like insane. Like even when we were talking about like, oh, yeah, you know, this is definitely going to happen. These stores are not going to remain online in perpetuity. Um, I'm personally astounded that the the PlayStation 3 is even still functional as far as like a downloading um, as far as downloading games goes, you know, but. The fact that they didn't at least give, like, I think what I said last week was, like, at least a year, you know? Right. You, you tell people a year, and, and if you were going to do it on July 2nd or August, then you should have said this in August or July of last year, and I think more people would have been okay with that. Um, the fact that it's just so close, like, this is April. April, like, we're not that far off from these days. Or from these these um, shutdown dates, and I think it's just. Um, I mean, you, you say it's like it's safe to assume that this functionality will exist in perpetuity, the, the ability to download your games that you've already purchased. But like, I, honestly, at this point, like, do we even like? I, I don't know. I have no idea because like, yeah, I mean, my, that is, that is an assumption. My my assumption is simply based on attrition, right? Like, I right, think right. that it's safer at this point after they take the stores offline to be like, we'll just wait you out because you're that's none of true. you are going to have a working console soon. You know, right. like it's just not going to even yeah, yeah, not even going to happen. But that's that's the thing. It's like eventually, eventually it will stop, and and eventually, like I mean, it, it, most PSPs are have naturally exploded by now. So like, um, the fact that they've even kept the PSP store open this long, even if it is, even if it was neutered in 2016, um. I don't know, man. This is uh, just really, I want to say shocking, but it kind of isn't, you know, like the, yeah, the I mean, way that they a, handled it. There's a lot to be said about this. And I'm, I'm sorry to people that are watching the show. The sun keeps coming in and out. So I keep messing with the exposure on my camera. I don't even know if that comes through or not, but like, I'll make it brighter right now. See, isn't that nice? Um, so I think the best way to organize this conversation and to make sure we don't, don't leave anything out is I just took a bunch of inquiries from the audience. And uh, of course, you guys can write in one of your perks on Patreon. Patreon.com slash last damn media is the ability to submit inquiries to the show. We read a bunch of them each episode. So let's start with Duncan Leishman. He says, hey, chaps, what do you think the real reason is that Sony doesn't appear to be actively pursuing backwards compatibility or care about game preservation? It's got to be financial, right? Surely they can afford it, but maybe they think it would be or would not be profitable enough. Could they possibly be working on it and will reveal it? And whenever they, their take on Game Pass is, would their Game Pass even be considered a success if they announced it uh, without the back catalog of at least their first party games? So you're getting a little lost in the weeds here, but we'll, we'll try to talk about this in the most logical way that we possibly can, which is. Because, again, I, I'm sick of talking about Game Pass and I'm sick of talking about PlayStation now. Mm -hmm. And I'm also sick about people comparing them like Sony has the answer to Game Pass and PlayStation now, which, again, we've established is just not the same thing. I don't care yeah. also, how many games are on it if you have to stream them. I don't give a shit. Right. Uh, so let's start here, Chris. Do you think that Sony is going to have a solution that will allow us to access these stores in some sort of legacy way one day, whether to kind of bring these games forward and repurchase them or to access them, like I said, by having a license and then maybe we'll download it with some emulator or something like, what do you uh, think about their, how they're working this? I would like that, but I just don't think, um, I don't think that's happening. I, I think if that was happening, that would be the way they would have announced this. Um, or at least they would have maybe teased if that was really something that was in the near future. I, f I feel like it would be something like, Hey, you know, uh, we're shutting down these stores, 
but um, they they would probably tease something, tease some kind of silver lining to it. If there was any kind of plan that this would play into, like some kind of hey, you're still gonna you're gonna be able to play Resistance too soon, uh, natively on your PS5. I don't think that's going to be happening. Um, quite honestly, I don't I don't know if you, you know maybe getting backwards compatibility running is insanely expensive, and it is something that like Microsoft is uniquely able to do because they're just made of money, literally. Maybe that is true. I have no idea how any of this works. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a a, a cloud engineer. You know, I don't know how any of this stuff you works. Are. Yeah. But you know, I also want to say that Game Pass is not backwards compatibility. I don't think it's fair to bring up game pass and in conversations about backwards compatibility because that's not really the point of game pass um that xbox did backwards compatibility through you know firmware and and software engineering that it's impressive but that's not game pass so i think it's it's weird it's actually well i agree but it actually is also makes microsoft's case against sony even more I think that they that is actually a totally separate thing that has nothing to do with Game Pass. That is also an option that is not on Sony. Right. Exa- you know? Yeah, no, exactly. It, it, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's it's better for Sony that it's it's not right. a, a product just of Game Pass. I'm just saying it's like, sure, people are conflating things like Game Pass is not backwards compatibility. Game Pass is just like a subscription service. But yeah, I, I don't see this being solved anytime soon. I, I think I was naive enough to think they would have solved it <laughs> for launch. You know, like at least some part of me was like, oh, they're probably going to have they, they got to have some solution. But I just I my faith in Sony as far as anything legacy oriented or backwards compatibility oriented is um, satisfactorily uh, withered to a point where it's just not there. I feel like. When the rumor happened, the reason I didn't trust it completely not that that it was wrong mm-hmm. about what was going to happen, but that the timing might have been off was just because I was like, well, would they really announce something without having something else in place? Because it's such a bad optical thing for them to do, even if it doesn't hurt their bottom line. And it doesn't seem like we're right. going to talk about that in a little while. Does this really hurt them? And the answer is probably not. But I think the longer term issues are deleterious to PlayStation as a brand because they seem less concerned about their older games and that's a problem for them so i'm wondering dustin like what do you think about this question of sony having something planned because i i think i guess the best way i can put it is the longer they stayed quiet after the rumor came out remember we established that they often just say we don't comment on rumors and speculation well they never said anything and to me i was like well this is strange because um why wouldn't they clarify it? Why wouldn't they at least say that usual term? And the longer the silence, you know, like after a court case, when the longer it takes a jury to come back, the better I think it is for the for the defense or whatever. And so, like, you start to, like, read certain things into this, like this silence. And I was starting to read into it. Like, what is going on with these guys? Why are they remaining so quiet? Are they planning something and trying to get their eggs and, you know, their ducks in a row? And it wasn't so. So my now my faith in them having some sort of solution to this is is maybe more minimal than it, or lower than it was. But I still feel like they have to they still have to solve the problem of, of backwards compatibility access or these things are just dead. Like these platforms are just are dead. And I, I, I don't feel like that's acceptable. What do you think? So someone in our one of our patrons on Discord wrote something. And I want to read a snippet of it because it brought a really unique perspective about this idea of caring about legacy. This is from uh, one of our users, Takoyaki. He said, in Japan, in terms of media, movies, music, games, whatever, uh, if anything is like four to five years old, it's con- considered extremely old in Japan. And watching, listening, or playing old games is considered abhorrently disgusting and just overall unattractive to Japanese people. I'm from Japan, but naturalized in the States and have been around American culture long enough. And I do wish to play old games legally as well. But when I go to Japan and listen to Aerosmith songs or watch movies that are more than five years old, I constantly get content for consuming said media. My friends and family constantly shout at me saying, that's too old, move on. Or why are you playing that old ass game? Are you okay in the head? To Japanese, consuming <laughs> old media gives very, very strong vibes of not being able to move on, stuck in the past, or you're possibly mentally ill or something. I remember I was on Japan Twitter a while back and tweeted in Japanese saying that I was watching The Dark Knight again, only to be followed by replies from strangers consisting of, too old, or WTF man, move on. 
So he wrote some other mm. stuff, but I think that was a good consolidation. So I'm curious, uh, first of all, just I'd love to know if there's any other Japanese listeners that can confirm um, that cultural aspect. Not saying I don't don't believe him, but I'm very interested in this idea just because mm-hmm. we've seen Sony uh, throughout its many years be Japan first. They're a very Japanese company. We know that for a long time, Sony Japan was very much in charge and not Sony uh, of America. And so I'm curious if we're seeing, um, you know, old, old, uh, the, the Japanese arm of Sony be like, yeah, we don't, we don't care about legacy. And that's a cultural aspect. We don't care about these old games because why would you want to play them? We've seen Jim Ryan echo this and maybe he's trying to, in his own way, translate that uh, that viewpoint. So, but doesn't that show? Doesn't that? I mean, that's true. People are bringing up what Jim Ryan said specifically about Gran Turismo, mm-hmm, right? Um, but it it conflicts with the whole like he was saying that at a Sony sponsored Gran Turismo event in which they put out the games to play. So there's clearly like an, 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 an if that's the way he really feels, that there's clearly an internal messaging problem, mm-hmm. and. It, it's what you're saying is is I think whoever you're citing about this Japanese thing is probably I think overstating it. That's and, kind of what I th- and I I mean based on I'm not Japanese but based on my own ex- pretty extensive experience with Japan Japanese culture I I don't know if it's quite that bad. Um, I saw plenty of people on in, on trains in Japan playing Game Boy and shit. It wasn't like you know or PSP. I mean PSP is ancient and you know that was like during the Vita era. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know quite. I don't know quite to the extent that that's really true, but it could be. But I, I to me, I look at it more in, uh, along the lines of the Western control of Sony is what's squeezing these things out. And um, I don't think that this is a good idea to abandon your old platforms like this to a degree where. You're not really explaining. It's like very corporate speak. It shows no respect for the mm-hmm. console. It shows no respect for the handheld. It's some bullshit that you find on a Q&A somewhere. I tweeted. I'm the one who tweeted out the dates, the, the dates first. Like when I, you know, when I first saw them, people hadn't even reported on it for hours after that. And um, to me, I was like, this is not an acceptable communication. Where is your celebration of these platforms? Where is your concern about access to games that are going to be gone. And when you look at the list that people are circulating of games that are going to be gone, like they're going to be gone. If you don't own the licenses to them, including some of their own games like Tokyo Jungle and other like second party and first party games, like what are you guys doing? Yeah. Don't you care? And that's why I still feel in my heart like maybe there is uh, combined with recent patents about backwards compatible trophies and all that. Maybe they are trying to do something, but you would imagine, Chris, that they would try to sync those initiatives up and that's why I just don't feel very confident because you would think like all right like the cat's out of the bag people know we're doing this are new technologies that will give people some backwards compatibility some virtual console that we're working on is not ready yet let's just extend the life of the stores there's no reason to bring us any attention until we're ready to show you the solution so that Mm. when we say we're shutting down PS3 and Vita access people are like well wait and then you're like well but we're going to have a collection of games that we're working on porting here are some of them here are our partners etc and so on yeah I I I, it's just such a mess the way they've handled this and 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 the Japanese kind of um, cultural aspect would be interesting if not for the fact that it seems like comp- completely idiosyncratic with the way that like Sony has been running for the last like 10 years like in the PS3 generation where we saw like tons of remasters and tons of collections and like you know a, a backwards compatibility compatibility storefront for the PS1 you know during a, a more Japan focused Sony and now that we're seeing a Sony that is more America focused, launching in America first, primarily like having their headquarters here, now is when they have like a, a cultural connection to J- Japan and their views of nostalgia. Like I just, I don't know if I buy that reasoning. Um, not necessarily because I don't believe that that's a thing that exists in Japan. I just think it would be like really baffling as a as a business strategy to do that when when you're not even really Japan focused anymore. I. I, I the thing that's just weird about it is the way that Sony kind of treats the the their older platforms is, is just so uniquely. Um, I don't want to say shameful. Like it's like it's almost like they're ashamed, even though they're not. 
because it's like over on the, the the Xbox side in December of 2020, 343 was like, hey, uh, online functionality for the original Halo games on 360 is going offline in a year. And those were just that's just for a series, you know, on a th- on the 360, like older than so the fact that an entire storefront is going down in a few months is kind of it's just really confusing and, and just really weird and I just uh, it's annoying and they should have a solution but they I don't think they do yeah we'll f- we'll see I mean there are other angles I want to approach this from Platinum Adventures wrote in and said hello I was reading through different social channels about the closing of the stores and it's interesting how the majority don't really care about old games they want the new hotness, not be not old and busted games. Seems like a good business decision from PlayStation in the long run. Why? Because they can drop sad news like closing of the PSN and the next week PlayStation could drop a trailer for their next gen new next gen game and gamers will have forgotten everything about the closing. In some way, this is this is, I think, not untrue. Mm-hmm. I just think things seem to be piling up a little bit for Sony. It's not like. I don't think companies need us to defend them. And I don't know that Sony's really in a defensible position right now in a lot of different ways. I'm not crazy about this. All this stuff aside, I'm not crazy about their their they're committed to generations one month, you know, one day, the next day, they're just going to release everything across both generations, negating any need for a PlayStation five. They don't have enough supply f- to meet the outrageous demand for their console, which sucks for their consumers who are now, you know, bent on buying things on the black market, which is optional, but they really could have avoided a lot of this by just delaying the console that didn't need to be launched when it was anyway. I actually think the console maybe launching around now would have made a lot more sense. Um, So they would have been able to satiate much more of the demand and all of that. So I have a lot of problems with the things they're doing. I think they're a a little bit confused with their marketing. I don't feel like they're incredibly communicative. I don't feel like they're personable. I don't feel like we're a long ways away from Shuhei Yoshida and Gio Corsi and yeah. um, and Jack Trenton and all of these different guys. We are we are eons away from that Sony. And that sucks because that was the Sony that was fun. Meanwhile, Xbox has real communicators and they might be marketers, but they're at least communicators. And um, whether you're talking about Aaron Greenberg or obviously Phil Spencer and others like they, they know how to speak. Um, and, you know, um, I don't feel like Sony is on par with them. The big thing there, though, is is games, game quality. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like they they are going to have game game quality that's higher than Microsoft for some time to come. But again, parity is going to be reached there at some point, too, because of just the massive first party investment that's been made on the other side. And I feel like Sony is a little bit it's a kind of a strange Sony right now. I don't even know why you would try to bring any unnecessary negative attention to yourself that maybe in a vacuum, let's say they did this at a time when things were really looking great for them. People had their consoles. There were a lot of games. Things were juiced. Maybe it's a little different, but that's not quite the way it is right now. A lot of people are frustrated with Sony. And so I'm a little mystified by it. I just wanted to throw yeah. that out there. I, I don't feel like it's I mean, I'm sure you guys are seeing this, too. It's not untrue that people are not a lot of people are not amped up about old games, but it does suck that the, the cutoff point, the cutoff point for this, this deliberation basically is um, November 2013. Everything released on PlayStation after that is available in perpetuity and will be available forever as long as it was on PS4 and anything before that PS3, PSP and obviously Vita stuff both before and after it's gone. It's going to be gone and that. That kind of sucks. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. All right. Brody Rainey wrote into us and said, hello, sacred boys. I am saddened by the closure of the old PSN store, but also can't help but feel like Sony is really the biggest loser here. The preservation of games is historically done by modders and homebrew enthusiasts. There are far too many legal agreements and logistics for a publisher to 100% maintain access to everything they've ever sold. When you think about it, there are so many PC games that you cannot buy anymore. Not even old games like Lord of the Rings and King Kong. Yet you can download most of, if not all of them for free on abandonware sites. When a publisher says goodbye, it's 100% consumer driven at that point, which is usually a good thing. No access suddenly becomes unlimited access with the right tools. I'm not defending Sony. I'm just pontificating on the whole thing and why the only people really losing is Sony themselves. And they may not have had anything to do or anything to lose in their eyes. This is pretty interesting because this goes back to the whole philosophical conversation we had last week, Chris, Mm -hmm. about. And I didn't think about this until I read Brody's question, which is interesting. It's like, did Sony we were talking about the difference between your moral obligation not to pirate 
and your legal obligation, not the pirate. And by and I remember I said that my big barometer is, is your game readily accessible? Doesn't mean that I don't have to own a piece of hardware or something. Can I access this game? And if your answer is no, then the moral obligation goes way down. And Brody's argument here is, is that Sony basically just lowered the universal moral obligation of pirating their games, um, their older games. I don't agree with that full stop, but it's an interesting philosophy to say like, well, I, he, he put it really well. He says no access suddenly becomes unlimited access. Yeah. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, how do you um, feel about that? I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not super experienced in in in, in this this arena. I haven't really downloaded stuff. I, I I think the last time I ever really did anything like that was in the PS1 generation, where like my like parents' friend modded my PS1 and I was able to like burn discs on it. But like after after PS1, I never bothered with like downloading ROMs or anything like that. So like I. I, I I'm not driven to do this kind of stuff, but I, I understand the perspective here of just like, yeah, you know, look, if you're not going to put this out, if, if you guys aren't going to have this readily available, it, it just sort of becomes a free for all at that point. And I just don't really have a problem with it. Like, I wouldn't do it because I just don't have to. Um, but, you know, I did with Melee. Like Melee was the only thing I've, I've ever tried because it's like they're not going they're not going to put Melee out again because if they put Melee out again on on the Switch. It's going to destroy <laughs> it's going to destroy probably the new Smash Brothers because it's like the best Smash Brothers ever. And uh, they probably don't want competition with their own stuff, which is like a, a fair perspective. But still that, you know, if people have the files and people have the code, then they're going to do what they want. And I th- quite honestly, I think that's totally fine if you've made it so they can't even support you if they want that. Yeah, you've lowered the moralistic boundary to nothing. Yeah. Uh, like it, it, at that point, it's just moral in in what in how much you feel like you will have a moral obligation to legality. It's like right. We all have smoked a lot of marijuana in states where it's illegal. I have no moral obligation to that law at all. I don't give a shit. You know, it doesn't matter to me at all. So like, they can lower or or make higher the moral or or legal obligation, but it's not going to affect me personally. But this is one of those situations where it's like, well. There are two counter tracks here, one moral and one and one legal and the legal track that will always exist. Mm -hmm. And this is the point that David Jaffe was making recently, which I agree. It's like the moral track exists. But what do you think, Dustin, about this idea? I really love the way Brody put it of no access suddenly becomes unlimited access. Like Sony must know that this is true, that they've kind of take like if you consider like the four nails in a coffin right like two of them were already kind of like off and then they just took off another one basically by saying like well the undead monster is basically getting out of that coffin now like you you can't really keep the emulation scene down now that you are removing the ability you know, for you to b- use this b- stuff before before it doesn't yeah. i'm sorry to cut you off doesn't i, I wouldn't be surprised if sony's cell architecture for the ps3 is just so fucked that they're like uh it's not happening and if you guys could figure it out maybe like like, (laughs) and they'll just do the whole like uh nintendo thing where they just like ripped a bunch of roms off the internet and sold it for the for the mario collections i wouldn't be surprised if that's kind of like a something that they would do i don't think that's their plan but i wouldn't be surprised if they were like hey if they could if the if the fans can figure out how to get you know resistance to running on non-cell architecture for free you know they're doing our job for us and we don't have to do it Right. What do you and companies do that. <laughs> so, yeah, it, I mean, the free for all has already begun and yeah. uh, it's already it's only going to get more, uh, pro, you know, prolificate at this point in that. So there's a, a YouTuber I watched a video from the other day. His, uh, his channel is Mon- Modern Vintage Gamer, and he does a lot of stuff involving emulators or hacked consoles, stuff like that. And basically, I think the point that he made that was really good was that. The PS3 emulator, which I can't remember what it's called on PC, is getting pretty good. It's not perfect, uh, but it's getting pretty good. Certain games like Demon Souls, uh, because that was a big focus for that emulator to get that game running, because at the time, for years, it was trapped on the PS3 with no other major way to play it. And I'm pretty sure you can play Demon Souls, the PS3 version, at 60 FPS through that emulator. But... Now that there is a strong demand for that emulator to work, 
he his point in the video is that expect this thing to get better rapidly because there's going to be a lot more eyes on it, a lot more support for it and developers that are interested in helping with it because of the fact that some of these games, you will not be able to play them other than on that piece of software. And that is on Sony because they're they don't have any way for us to play these ps3 games so right and their argument's going to be like well you do because you have until x date to buy it and then you're kind of hoping and praying your hardware survives and that's why i'm saying like i think it's a battle of attrition in some way for them like they they realize like well the die is cast we we they probably have a better understanding than anyone of when they expect their hardware to die especially as well and they might just be like well you're gonna find out in a few years when, when all your ps3s are dead you know like what, what what's uh What's happening here? So I, I it is an interesting it, it does just open up this huge philosophical and moralistic rupture. And uh, you're right. It does bring a lot of attention and sympathetic people to the cause. I'm a little more neutral, uh, I think, personally, because I understand both aspects of it. I am. I think David Jaffe's argument that says, like, just because something doesn't isn't purchasable doesn't mean it doesn't exist is is a really compelling argument his argument being like you don't have a right to the access to the game and you're making a lot of assumptions that these studios aren't saving their games and a lot of them are you know so that is also worth throwing into the conversation but sure we have another one here i wanted to get into this because this is bought this whole corollary to this is bothering me because i don't think it, it, it doesn't seem related at all Austin Morgerson wrote in and said, hey, CCD, I've been buying digital games for the last seven years. So with the news of old PSN stores closing, it's making me question my way of purchasing games. Do you think this is going to be a bad look for Sony? Do you think this is going to scare people off who buy digitally like me? I feel like this will make people feel skeptical, especially if they were planning on buying the all digital PS5. Honestly, I'm planning on switching back to physical after hearing the news. Love the pod, by the way. Keep up the awesome work. So. I feel like there's so much mixed up shit in this in, in, and I'm not saying it's just this question, but just in this like this line of thought. You can basically be guaranteed that 2013 to present PSN will be available probably until PlayStation doesn't exist anymore. I think that that's all baked into the cake. PS5 is backwards compatible with PS4. So that brings everything up. I see you skeptical. Your skeptical face, Dustin, which I'm interested to, to pick at because not pick at literally. I don't want to pick at your face. Uh, but I want to pick your brain on this because well, why are you skeptical of that? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that PSN beginning with PlayStation 4 is a unified. It's totally unified. Everything is available on it right. on the newest piece of hardware. So so I think that to me, I'm like, that seems like safe. I think it's the exact opposite of what Austin's saying, ironically, which is that the people like me who earliest adopted digital sales, which was way earlier than seven years ago, are the ones who are getting fucked. The ones who proved the mar the model are the ones who are getting most fucked. The people who jumped on late are the ones who are getting least fucked. If you bought anything on you saying for the last seven years, so that's um, twenty fourteen, it's like you're totally fine. You, you know, it, you're all your games on PS4 are going to be available. It's the people like me that were running around telling you to buy everything digitally in two thousand nine that are going to be the big losers here. But I'm wondering, uh, Chris, what do you think about this this move towards now skepticism in digital markets. I don't think that I think this is misplaced. I think this is a really one off thing. I don't think Sony in 10 years is going to be like, we're taking the PlayStation four games offline. There's no way I, I literally do not think that that that's even possible for them to consider, you know, like because it's all unified now. So what do you think about kind of people conflating, in my opinion, these different things? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I understand. Like, I, I do think it's a little bit doom and gloomy. I, I, I don't think necessarily that you should like, look, even the PS3, dude, that that hardware is ancient. And the store has been operational until now. Like, that is kind of wild. And I, I guarantee you most of the people who are really in the know about this kind of thing in the first place, I, I guarantee you they've all moved on from PS3. Like, you know, so the, the time span by which these stores live is reasonable enough. Um, like it doesn't scare me away from buying digital. I, I know for a fact that, like, I haven't touched my PS3 anyway. Like, whatever. It's been so long that at this point, yeah, I'll buy if they have some digital solution to some game that I bought on the PS3 on PS5. I'll probably just buy it at this point because it's been so long. Um, but I do understand how for some people it seems like 
oh, I'm going to just lose access to my stuff eventually, which is not necessarily what they're saying here. Obviously, you can keep you can continue to download the games that you've purchased already. But again, that's like another thing where it's like we assumed that they would give, you know, the users of these platforms much more of a heads up as to how long it would be before these storefronts collapsed. Um, that same, you know, that same thought or that same mishandling of an announcement could easily happen with the availability of you or, or the or the um, player's ability to download stuff that they've already purchased. Because obviously that stuff we assume is going to last for a long time, but that's server load, you know, like downloading stuff is still like that's there's going to be a point in the future by which a lot of these games just aren't going to be it's not going to be reasonable or cost effective to keep those servers running for people to download their previous purchases so i i I get the sentiment but i think people also just have to take into account how long it took to get here and the fact that you're going you're gonna be fine like digital is perfectly fine like it's been fine on pc for a long ass time already um it's been fine on consoles for a long time I wouldn't worry about it. By the time you even realize something like this is going to affect you, you've probably already moved past the the, the major consequences of it anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's strange because I just... For me, it's like, what is the difference? If you wanted to play a PlayStation 3 game, other than like overt access of a game that is not available digitally but is available physically or vice versa which is yeah. there's a lot of use cases on ps3 but it's like what's the difference between like going and saying like well i have a game on disc or i have a game digitally it's like well if you own a playstation 4 you're going to need a, a playstation 4 that reads the disc or it's going to read the game on psn like nothing is different for you so i think people are getting a little mm, dramatic yeah. like a little histrionic about about some of this so i want to i want to be fair about that for but, sure but dustin I'm curious in throwing it kind of over to you. I, I wonder. I'm a little confused about like this, this run on physical games right now that's happening. It doesn't make any sense. Like the physical games are still not being produced. They haven't been produced in years. PS threes haven't been produced in almost 10 years. And I feel like, what is the, you know what, you know what I mean? Like, why would this one market affect the other market? It's like Tales of Exilia on disc is still on disc. You still need to find a PS3 to play it. None of that has changed. So what do you, what do you think? So like, why is there such a, like a jittery market right now over this? I feel like everyone's nervous for no reason. I think you're most likely right that going from PS4 on, you're going to be fine. I think the reason that people are, concerned is that we have seen games that have disappeared from stores that are only accessible through um having the physical media i mean and that's the thing for me is that the only true guarantee of of a game of a license which this is where i'm really curious when you have that conversation with hogue is that if you do have the physical hardware and you have the physical box because theoretically i mean it depends on the game now with so many online only games but um you could open up a a launch ps4 that has never been updated and put in a copy of the last of us fart part two i almost said fart two oh. <laughs> um, that, that's oh. a whole different game um which we could explore but hold on uh, keep keep going i gotta bring the dog uh, okay. downstairs but uh yeah, and so that's a, that's a guarantee. I mean, there's just so many... Like I said, I think that it is most likely... In fact, I would say 99% of me says, yes, uh, going forward, PS4 and the digital storefront is going to be just fine. But there are factors in, like, Sony could make some horrendous decisions that starts an escalating downward, and they eventually close shop which most likely someone would buy them at that point and buy all the assets and then we have someone else involved on whether or not they want to keep the store running and maybe maybe they decide to shut it down maybe there's just there's many factors that at the end of the day the hard media is the only the the closest guarantee which is important to to some people there are 
there well there is i mean we talked about a little bit about this last week but there is a question about what sony gains from doing this and we should talk about that hey ccd uh noah says with the news that the legacy stores are closing is there any way that this could be a good thing trying to play devil's advocate here what's the possibility that sony is shutting these stores down to free up resources for something else it's probably pretty slim but just wanted to ask as always thanks for the great content well and i'm sorry i keep changing the exposure here there we go um the uh the reality is is that i'm sure this saves sony a lot i'm sure that this is a a situation that they looked at and were like well we don't have to pay bean counters to it's like i said last week like there's a lot go that goes on behind the scenes and a company like sony doesn't make money like this they don't make money by having a million different open accounts with people maybe buying a few games a a quarter and writing checks for ten dollars and i mean this is like an annoying thing and i'm sure that it does free up a lot of resources considerably. But the question as a consumer we have to ask ourselves is like, why do we care? These aren't resources that we're gonna see like any benefit from. This is resources that save Sony um, some money and it saves Sony some internal resources for their investors and maybe allows them to distribute money more evenly to places where it's more needed. But it's not gonna save any money or any time or anything where we need it or care about. So I don't care you know, about that. It's not like so- Sony's yeah. not going to be like, we're doing this. And so we're going to make another new exclusive. It's like, no, that's not the, that they're totally unrelated to each other. And so I don't yeah. care whatever Sony's benefit is from this. <laughs> yeah. All I right. Agree. Now, a big question was how this affects developers. Dustin, you brought this up earlier and I can give a lot of insight into this as a developer. Roby Kurobi Zapanta wrote into us and said, Hey, threesome CCD, how do you guys, especially Colin, feel about the disrespect that Sony did by not alerting developers ahead of time regarding the PS Vita store shutdown? I hope that you guys can make a free Sacred Symbols Plus episode that highlights the must have games for PS3, PSP, and PS Vita, especially the ones that are digital only, since they are, at least for now, allowing you to download your purchased games. Um, and then he goes on about how worried we are about all this stuff, but and so I wanted to bring that up, too. And the reason I, I, cl- I selected his question was so we can talk about we will. And a lot of people wrote in about this. We will cover Vita, PS3 and PSP intently. I would ex- expect PS3 and Vita coverage more than PSP coverage, because to Sony's credit, they basically did neuter the PSP in 2016. You only had like very, very specific access to it, usually through Vita. So um, we're not going to get too into PSP that that ship has kind of sailed already. But in terms of like the disrespect shown to developers and all that, well, I am one and we were working on a Vita game. Now, I'll explain to you guys how this affected us at Lilymo. In order to we use an engine called Game Maker for our games. And there's an older version of Game Maker that works for Vita. And then there's a newer version of Game Maker that severs that old version and it, it works for like all current consoles like Switch, PS4, PS5, et cetera. So we are at, we actually build our games, as I think I've noted on this show, our lead build is the Vita. The reason we do that is not to be cute. The reason we do that is because we need the most basic version of the game on that old engine and then we can render the game on that engine running on Vita and then we can take it and kind of bring it forward to the new version of Game Maker and then reestablish the game inside that engine and use it for the other uh, the other newer consoles. So no one is using the old version of Game Maker unless you really have a reason to. And so we were building our newest game, which I think Barry let out of the let out the the word that we've codenamed Forest Guardian. And I don't think that's going to be the final title, but in fact, it's not going to be the final title. It's to me too generic, but I, I like the the, code, the working code name. But um, we, it sucks for us because we built we built our in our building Forest Guardian on Vita, only to release it on Vita, and we weren't told that this was happening. In fact, as we noted, we bought. So there's a difference between dev kits and test kits. Barry has a dev kit. I have a test kit, and I bought. We bought this test kit from them on um, just in March. And it costs money and we don't really care about the money. In fact, I'm very glad to just put the test kit away and forget about it for a little while. Um, So that really doesn't affect me at all. Sony, I have like old PS2 dev kits and shit. Like Sony doesn't give a fuck about these things, but it sucks for us because we put all of these resources and this time into a game that simply will not be done in time to publish. And so we have to we had to kind of scramble this week to say, like, we need to port the game forward sooner than we thought which was something that had to happen eventually, but it's just kind of a waste because we had only been doing this for a version of the game that we're not able to release. The reason that it bothers me 
is not only because they didn't communicate this with anyone, not only because they they sold us a test kit knowing that we were not going to be able to use it, which was really weird, but that they definitely let another developer know what was happening in the form of Flying Oak Games. Now, I'm not trying to call these guys out. I have no problem with Flying Oak at all. They're nice guys. They're making um, a game for Vita called Scourge Bringer, but they were informed by Sony and, and openly said that Sony let them know that they were the last Vita game. So Sony let other developers know our business before we knew our business. And like Dustin said it near the top of the show, we weren't the only ones affected. In fact, I would argue that because of our financial placement, we're probably one of the least affected studios because our games sell pretty well. So like it's not a huge deal. It's just an annoyance and obnoxious because we love the Vita. But for developers that like if a, if a developer that was on a shoestring or working with a publisher had that happen to them, they'd be fucked. And yeah. it, it's it sucks. So it's not fair. We don't like the way we were appreciated. Sony doesn't communicate well behind the scenes. They didn't let us know anything, even though we were inquiring, even after the rumors, even even after selling us a test kit. And uh, it's unfair. So, yeah, that's the answer. It's it's not fair. And we're mad about it. And. What annoys me the most is that, like, we are pretty loyal to PlayStation, so we want to make those like the lead the lead versions of the games. But similar to what I'm hearing from other indie developer friends, some saying it publicly, some saying it privately, like we're not really interested in making PlayStation a lead platform for our game. Like we'll release it on PS4 and PS5, but we don't one of what one of my friends said to me was like, we have no in his studio has no faith that Sony will even to the point we're making, like where like they don't care about their legacy at all. And Microsoft seems to be committed to making sure that everything is stuck together. So when we look at it, we're like, well, why wouldn't we just do Xbox as a lead platform? If it's just going to be a port anyway, it doesn't really matter. And at least we know that they're going to respect our game a little bit more and respect us and our time and our efforts a little bit more. So it was a, it was sand in the face to lots of different people that still were trying to support this thing and trying to do right by it and trying to do right by the audience there. And it was really improperly handled. Um, and so just that's a little bit of insight into people about how it affected us and why it affected us specifically. And I know that Barry is frustrated, too, because people are asking questions that are pretty thoughtless, but they're questions that Sony might have helped us answer. You know, people are like, why don't you release a package file and let us play, you know, on a hacked homebrewed Vita? It's like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, dude. Why don't we put our 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 new game and give it to you for free? So you can so you can play it for free on a hacked version of a piece of hardware, which if Sony knew that we were doing that would lock us out of ever releasing anything on their game uh, on their platforms. Game. Brilliant ideas that we're getting out there <laughs> from people. Great idea, guys. Let's definitely give you our game for free. That sounds good. Also, Barry's frustrated because it shows a real lack of understanding of like the, the and this is what we always try to educate people with in our on our show on sacred symbols is like the amount of effort that goes into making games it's not trivial yeah Yeah. and so it was a waste and but yeah i know barry was like really getting annoyed at people asking him about like releasing in here and doing this and can we still cross by and we think you the other thing is like people trying to tell us like what we need to know well i think it's this it's like no dude i think we understand how to release games on vita we've released four of them so I think we 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 understand at this point. So that was an additional layer of frustration for us is like people coming in trying to tell us like what we like. Yeah. How, can you uh, seems like you can release a game on PS4 cross by and then you could still download it on Vita. And I'm like, no, you're fucking wrong, because it says it clearly on our emails that we get from developers that we have to pass certification by July. So stop messaging me <laughs> like you have more information than me. They're mansplaining to you. Stop your mansplaining. Um, All right. A few other things and then we'll move on. Michael Alamo wrote into us and said, what's up, fellas? Since I plan on buying a bunch of Vita games before the shutdown, I wanted to see the prices of the memory cards only to find out that they are just as expensive as they were, if not more so. I mean, what did you think was going to happen? What is the optimal sized memory card and what price should I find it for? Are there any good alternatives? Thank you for everything you do. So to answer your last question first, there are no alternatives. You can use SD cards with homebrewed Vitas, but you're not going to be able to have accurate or timely firmware and then access to the PlayStation store. You really have to kind of choose one or the other. Although people are messaging me that this is more possible than I think, but I don't mess around with that stuff. So, so I'm not the person to ask, but yeah. uh, so there's that for you to consider. But uh, Dustin, I saw you kind of cringing and I was too. How long have I warned you all? You know, to buy your stuff. I've been saying it for years. Buy your Vitas, buy your memory cards, buy your games. 
And now here we are. It is almost too late for many of you. Now, someone was saying like that they found a $350 brand new Vita or something. I'm like, you better buy that motherfucker brand new. Uh, yeah, you better buy it. So, uh, Dustin, what say you? I was I was looking in my Vita because I couldn't remember. I have a 16 gig card, which I think, what was this, $100 at one point or something like Jesus that? Like, they're Christ. ridiculous. I can't remember. They were absurd. Like, just absolutely absurd. I don't think it was that much for this. I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah, it was. They were high, though. What I think the highest is the highest 32 or 64, 64. But I don't think they released the 64 gig in the United States. So oh. they might have like in very limited quantities, but I don't think they did it at all. The beauty is, is that Vita is totally on, not region locked. So you can download you can just I have a Japanese 64 gig card, but I think in mine right now I have a 32 gig card. I wonder, I have not done any research on this. Do you know if any third party people have made cheap Vita cards? Like, I think are there, there are some that, I think there are some that exist, but I don't know. I think they're dubious in quality. You right. can look. Get some, but, like you can get 30 64 gig cards on AliExpress for $3. Probably. By the way, the 16, the 16, I, the 16 gig card was $70. 70, I, knew, okay. I knew you were a little off. I mean, yeah. it's still that's fucking still absurd. that's still absurd. I have a 64 gig. I don't even remember how much I paid for it. Dang, yeah, I'm pretty dang. sure that was never released domestically, but I could be wrong. Um, but the yeah, 64? I'm, yeah, I could. I, mean, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but I could have sworn it wasn't. Um, but uh, my so my only advice on memory cards is that the only unworkable run really is four gigs. I had oh. a four gig card. I had a four gig Japanese one. It was fine in the beginning, but there are games with patches that won't even fit on that. Like, I don't think you can even download Killzone on um, on a uh, a four gig card. So I would suggest 16 gig is pretty good. 32 gig. But if you're looking to like this is the rubber is really going to hit the road when so if and when Sony announces that the store is going away completely, as in you can't download anything anymore. At that point, you don't want to have as many big cards as you possibly can, because you're and that's going to be if that moment ever happens where you like basically have to download everything and like that's it. You know, and yeah. save it is uh, so aim higher. But I'm telling you guys, Vitas are exp- I mean, Vitas are more expensive than PS5s, you know, the new PS5 at this point, you know, at market price. Yeah, right. I'm looking at Play Asia right now, which is a, a good website that you can make sure that you're buying good products. We have a from. financial relationship with them. We should know. Right. We do have a financial relationship, but they do sell a lot of Vita stuff directly from Japan right now. If you want the Aqua Blue Vita, the one Colin you have sitting in a box. Yep. Right there. Do you know how much it is on PlayAsia? Five hundred. Five hundred and eighty-five dollars. Yeah, that sounds. I think right. they yeah. went up. Here it is. Recently. That's it, dude. I want one. Japanese. I don't know if I could drop five hundred eighty-five dollars on one now, but I knew that the prices were going to go up. It's too late. I mean, I don't know how you like. So I I have two more new ones. I have that one and another one. But that's it. That's it for me. The classic OLED. Though I, I would that honestly. One, yeah. I would argue, I think the OLED is a little better, in my opinion. If you're if you are shopping for one, OLED is just a nicer display in general. But right, yeah. All right, we have two more uh, comments that I think pose opposite ways for us to end this, and I think they'll they'll play off well from each other. Michael J. Buff Buffle, I think I said that wrote that right. I wrote that right. Says, "Hey guys, is it just me, or does all of Sony's coverage just have a negative spin?" While Sony has made some unfavorable decisions, everything I read and hear is doom and gloom. Just a reminder, Sony crushed the competition last gen, and from the games we know to be coming, they may repeat. Both PS5 and Xbox Series X and S are equally hard to get, yet the cries from the public are for PS5. Can we give Sony their roses, so to speak, while they are go- while they are doing well, or is it just a case of Sony's success making them a target? Thanks for the great content, guys. The other side, the other side, all right? Michael Dudich wrote in and said, hello, boys. Can I just say something real quick? I see people panic buying digital PS3 and Vita games, and I'm honestly taken aback by the stupidity on display here. Why would anyone reward Sony's terrible decisions this way to have games tied to their PSN account as if those purchases had any use at all in the broader PlayStation ecosystem? It's just more money thrown away on stuff stranded on hardware that is losing support before our very eyes. One of these days, people who have their PlayStation digital libraries filled with legacy software are going to get a rude awakening. A week ago, someone asked if it's moral to pirate these old games. I feel like the moral thing to do is to show Sony the middle finger. Hmm. That was from Michael Dudich. So two very different opinions here, Chris. What do you what is your take on Sony's current situation and how we, we move forward? 
My take is it's very simple. I've explained this a number of times, but they, you know, Michael, he says like, you know, Sony crushed the competition last gen. It's like, exactly. That's exa- that's exactly why people are more harsh on them now is because they've, they, they imagine you, you, you lead a race, right? You start off at the, at the beginning of a race and then you just jolt forward like a hundred meters, like immediately. And you're like, Whoa, what the hell? What is that? That's amazing. And then the next time you race, you're just stumbling drunkenly, just constantly being like, oh, by the way, yeah, we're shutting this down. Oh, yeah, no no solution for backwards compatibility. Oh, we can't figure this out. Sorry. Obviously, people are going to hold that to a higher criticism or, or obviously people are going to have more of an issue with somebody who is who has a history of doing well and then suddenly just fumbles as opposed to like on the Xbox side who fumbled hard last gen to the point where literally anything that they do that is positive is seen as like a massive leap forward you know and i'm not saying that backwards compatibility is like simple or like easy or just like a little thing but obviously that is something that they're doing right and in comparison to the way they operated before it is a massive uh leap forward as far as positive um optics go and i just think that's it's really that simple i think you know people are going to be harsher on the on the console that that did the best the previous gen i think i think that's honestly how it was with the xbox one also because you know the xbox one had its terrible reveal you know with tv and being and like football and like cable boxes but I remember that was like a direct response where they were like, hey, we're going to have this reveal event and then E3 is going to be all about the games. But that didn't matter because people's first impression was cable box, cable box, cable box. And that screwed them up. And people mm-hmm. were way harder on that than they otherwise would have been had the Xbox 360 not done so freaking well. And it really is just this basic thing. It's it's it, I think it's just basic psychology. I think it's just like, yeah you're not going to criticize a child for not hitting a home run, but you might criticize like, you know, like a major league baseball player if they can't just get a single home run and like an entire, like couple, couple get like, come on, dude, you know, it's your fucking you're job. With that, so you're struggling with that sports reference a little bit, but I obviously do, I I'm trying to translate it, but I can't, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. it is opening day by the way. So That's right. we're recording this on opening day. Always an American holiday. Uh, Dustin, what do you think? I mean, I, I, I agree with Chris. I feel like, the onus is on the winner to continue to win. People mm-hmm. are going to try to tear the winner down. That's the market and expectations differ. I mean, I remember in the early PlayStation three era, we had no expectations. So when Sony started delivering like resistance Two and all this other shit, people are like, oh, maybe like, you know, Uncharted two. I, I remember being really the when I came out in 2009, being a paradigm shifting game for PlayStation at a really meager time in their catalog. But I feel like the biggest thing I want to reiterate is companies don't need you to defend them yes and i don't understand why people care when a company is attacked and we don't attack sony because or at least i don't i mean i can't speak for others but i don't attack sony because i don't like them i love playstation uh but i'm a playstation analyst people come to me for my honest opinions and takes and my knowledge and this is an unusual situation that they're in now they're speaking out of both sides of their mouth they're losing the optical war and yeah, the, the, the wins that matter most, they may still be winning or the victories rather. Right. Like, so they're still selling consoles they're, They can't make enough of them. Uh, their games are very well considered. We're going to see if that continues with Returnal and with Ratchet, which I think it will. But then they speak out of both sides of their mouth. Like I said, like they pay homage to the old games, but then they don't want you to play them. They talk about how they believe in generations, but don't release generational games anymore. Uh, I'm really scared about what they're going to do with God of War now and all of this other stuff. And so I'm I feel like Sony needs their feet held to the fire, so to speak. And I don't feel like they that things are good. And we feel I feel like as fans, we need something. We need a win, right? Like, just like give us a little something. Give it like. You can't just give us a studio acquisition to give someone a win, right? Yeah. You can't just give someone a new game just to give them a win. But don't you have something to get people excited other than the promise of Horizon on PS4 and PS5? Because that's not really getting me very excited. It, I'm yeah. excited to play it, but it doesn't get me excited as a PlayStation 5 also, owner. What do you think, Dustin? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, so I'm I sorry. Just, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no. You're, um, I would just say that I don't know. I think a lot of people look at these situations as black and white. Like Sony is either doing the right thing or they're doing the wrong thing. And it's like, no, 
we can look at it and say, wow, they're first party output is the best in the biz and Mm -hmm. xbox isn't even going to come close i mean the only thing this when we look at 2021 i mean halo infinite which we don't even the jury's still out on that which Mm -hmm. to be fair the jury's still out on horizon return or whatever but um yeah we i think it's clear too from listening not that this is an attack on us but um I think we are so highly critical of sony because we love them you I always found the things I am the most critical of are the things that I that I love. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't I'm trying to remember the exact terminology here that he put. Let's see. Uh, while Sony has made some unfavorable decisions, everyone I read and hear is doom and gloom. It's like, well, yeah, well, right now there's a lot of doom and gloom. And just because we were so hot on the PS5 when it came out, which I think that our opinions about the console overall are still true, it's not going to change the bad news right yeah. now. That just doesn't make any sense. And and also, just I think I think you know, just criticizing these platforms for what they for what they do wrong just like leads to a better platform. Just gen- mm. generally speaking, I mean, Rackle. you saw that on the Xbox side super recently when they were like, "Hey, we're going to up the up the price of Xbox Live," and everybody was like, "What?" And then they was what did they, I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah." Probably probably not a good call. But the reason they're that receptive in the first place is because they know that they're the underdog here. They know that they're like they've got to win as much as, ground as they can. And that's kind of a situation that's good for consumers because you wouldn't have gotten like the I would argue pretty good state of Xbox now without that massive fumble in 2013. You wouldn't get this PC cross-generational kind of like interplay. You wouldn't get this like focus on backwards compatibility, even though it was like probably like a massive use of like resources and firmware wizardry. You wouldn't have gotten that. Like early on when that console was out, they were like backwards compatibility is impossible. And then they lost that generation hard and they were like, well, we got to make this possible. And I, I would argue that platform is all the better for that. And, you know, when people are criticizing PlayStation, it's not because they're just like they got this random hard on for hating the company. It's that, dude, you have an opportunity here to make this this ecosystem better than it already is. And why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't everybody want that? Hmm. It's really Very just well the said. base of criticism. Very well said. I don't think there's anything else to, to add. Yeah, we'll leave it there. All right. There are some other items, smaller items that we need to get through before we get into our listener inquiries. Number two. Sony has revealed April 2021's free games for PlayStation Plus subscribers. As always, these games are given out for free to everyone with an active PS Plus subscription. And even if you don't intend on playing these games now or even ever, there's no reason not to add them to your download list while they're free, as you can always revisit them later so long as your PS Plus subscription is active. Don't be stupid out there. I'm sick of it. The biggest game of the month is no doubt Oddworld Soulstorm, the forever in development continuation of the Oddworld series. Launching on both PS4 and PS5 on April 6, Soulstorm was initially announced in 2016 and slated for a 2017 launch before multiple obviously serious delays set it all the way back to 2021. It's developer Oddworld Inhabitants' first new game. I'm sorry, it's it is developer Oddworld Inhabitants' first new game in a stunning 16 years. Um, and uh, when it launches, uh, wait, what is? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll read that again. You can cut this out or not. I don't care. This is developer Oddworld Inhabitants' first new game in a stunning 16 years. Uh, 16 years ago, it launched Stranger's Wrath on the original Xbox in 2005. It has worked on various ports of its older games, however. It's important to note that only the PS5 version of this game is free. PS4 players will need to purchase the title. On PS4, two more free games are coming in hot. The first is the uh, first-party open-world zombie motorcycle game Days Gone from Sony-owned developer Ben Studio, which launched in April of 2019 on PS4 and which is coming to PS or PC imminently. The other freebie is PS4 Zombie Army 4 Dead War, a tactical-slash-survival shooter from Rebellion. We just talked about them. The studio behind Sniper Elite. So, uh, hey, we were talking about the, the, the positive and negative comparisons Sony draws right now. Sony murders Microsoft in the free game category. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Chris, what do you, how do you feel about this? Uh, I was especially lining it up with Xbox. I'll look it up, but Xbox's lineup of games is like laughable. Oh, yeah. Games, games so I, I gold. must give it up. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. What do you yeah. think about this uh, category or this yeah. uh, catalog of games? I think it's good. I, I'm not really like that big on obviously Days Gone, but there's no doubt that that's like a massive thing for free, especially if it's updated and, and you know, like... Um it does. It's not the uh, what is it the 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 pre patch version that we got that we played through. 
That's good. Zombie Army, I, I, I know a lot of people who like this. Like, I brought it up recently in a conversation, and they were like, oh, yeah. And I was like, what? What do you mean, oh, yeah? You've never mentioned this ever to me. <laughs> like, I have the trilogy, I think, they released on PS4, and I was reading a little bit about it, because I think it might have been free at one point. Rebellion is obviously a, the Sniper Elite Studio, like I said, and so this is a game that's actually, like I said, more tactical than survival, which doesn't sound... You know, like, when you're, like, killing dude, you know, like, you know, using your scope from, like, a mile away, and you gotta, like, Calibrate it. I'm like, I don't want to. Yeah, you got to take the wind into, into account. And shit. Yeah, I'm like, I don't want to do this, especially in a zombie. Game. I don't think it's quite that serious, but I don't want to do it in that. To, just to compare, by the way, on games with gold this month, Vikings, Wolves of Midgard, Truck Racing Championship, Dark Void and Hardcore Uprising. Yeah. So nothing. Yeah. Uh, so certainly you want to know a place where Sony's winning. It's certainly in the free game department. Dustin, uh, how do you feel about about these uh, these freebies? No, I think that Sony has done a fantastic job, especially uh, you have to imagine this is a lot of the work of uh, our boy Shuhei Yoshida uh, bringing some of these high quality independent titles uh, to PlayStation Plus. And they've really uh, led the charge. I mean, obviously, last month with Maquette was a game that I didn't really enjoy, but I would say that it was of high quality. Um and then, of course, Control before that. Oh, yeah. Um, and Bug Snacks. And I'm trying to think what other ones. They've had a couple. But uh, I like this. I like the um, the way that they're able to bring in a more mainstream game, which I saw people complaining that Days Gone, because it was part of the PS Plus collection, that this is a invalid free game for them. And I'm like... But, yeah, but you... Um, that's on PS5. PS Plus collection is for PS5, isn't it? Right. So right. So right. it's the free PS5 so, game is uh, is Odd World. Yeah. So that is that is I understand, but it isn't. I think Odd World is like a forty or fifty dollar game. Yeah. At launch, so it's a nice get. Lauren Landing clearly has a nice relationship with right with Sony for many years. Yeah. So so anyway, we saw Sony really break away from indies in the latter half of the PS4. Uh, I say the jury is still out overall, but I do like to see uh, these high quality independent games be front and center. Yeah, definitely. So again, PS Plus, I think a great value. I like the cloud saving personally, but the free games are a nice little thing to add. You technically never have to really buy games because these games start stacking up. And then before you know, it, you have a nice little catalog. All right. This next one is for Chris. This happened right after we recorded last week so it's kind of older news but we didn't discuss it here so for the for the uh uh for the court record let's read it number three developer turtle rock has delayed its much anticipated left for dead spiritual successor back for blood initially planned to be launched on june 22nd in just a couple of months the game has been delayed until october 12th a brief statement released on the official social media feeds for the game read in part quote Turtle Rock Studios is working hard to make Back for Blood the best game it can possibly be at launch, and the team needs more time to do this. We thank our community for its continued support and are excited to share that there will be an open beta this summer, end quote. Initially announced in 2019 and shown off for the first time in 2020, Back for Blood is a clear ode to the Left for, uh, ode to Left for Dead, only with a new publisher. Turtle Rock is now working with WB instead of Valve. This release marks Turtle Rock's comeback in a sense. Though they worked on some Oculus games since 2015's Evolve was the studio's last notable release, and it obviously struggled. Founded as a Counter-Strike porting and support studio, Turtle Rock was put on the map with 2008's Left 4 Dead, which never came to PlayStation platforms. Yeah. Very well regarded. Two games, Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2, and their DLC. I know you've been looking forward to this one, Chris. I I was a little disappointed in this, not because I'm playing it, but because it's so close to launch, you would think you would have said something earlier. Yeah, um, it is a little disappointing. I'm, I'm never going to uh, be disappointed in in a, in a delay, quite honestly. Like outside of just like, oh, obviously, like I wish I could have played that sooner. But I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to be like mad that a game is delayed because that just means it's probably going to be better. But you know, definitely, you know, this is something that I'm looking forward to quite a bit. I, I love, I love Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2. Those games are so good, and this looks exactly like it. It doesn't even look like they did anything particularly different with this. It's just like, hey. You know that thing you like? Here's more of that thing you like. And I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> this is exactly... Yeah, ev- this is Evolve perfect. was too it was too granular, I think, for what people were looking for. Ev- Evolve was too complicated for its own good. You know, people who were looking for just like a kind of like jump in, jump out kind of co-op 
you know, experience were just kind of like left playing this this thing that wanted to be way more than it was. Um, I gave it a shot and I just it was fun, but it, it it took too long to teach people how to play that game. Like I remember like trying to explain it to uh, the people that I was playing with and I was like, oh no, you got to do this and, you, and it works this way and you got to track the monster with the, with this ability and you got to pick this class and it's like Left 4 Dead was never like that. Everybody just intuitively understood how to play Left 4 Dead. So, you know, the, the, the announcement of an open beta is really, really awesome. I'm excited for that. I, I am a little disappointed yeah. that it's an October release. Uh, although it does make sense, I guess, like the yeah, know, thematically, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thematically, it's good. It's just like, man, that's it's going to be such a crowded freaking holiday. Definitely. Um, oh, my God, dude. The next from September through mid 2023 is going to be a shit show. Yeah, everyone's yeah. got to get their games out. Everything's been delayed till that point in time. It's going it's, yeah, it it's going to be rough. But, you know, Dustin, are you looking forward to this one? Yeah, I'm definitely excited to to check this out. I'm it, I'm wondering, do you think there's any benefit in releasing a more horror, spooky type game in October? Do you think that that could increase sales? Because I know that I sometimes will be like, oh, because it's that time of year, there's I'm seeing a lot of that imagery. I'm kind of in that that zone that would maybe I mean, I was going to pick this up game up no matter what, whether yeah. it's June or October. But I'm wondering, yeah, if I, that think could, well, I think it's a risk. I think it's a risk because like we were saying, thematically, it makes sense for the fall, but if you do tie something more in, and I understand this from a marketing perspective, if you tie it in the Halloween, then that's basically your, your sales window. Like you don't want to, you don't want to tie it too intimately into a holiday in which will pass and make the game seem old. So I totally true understand that mentality, but I, I still think October 12th is a good time for it. Um, mm-hmm. The sooner the better, but like Chris said, we have an open uh, beta to look forward to. I'm sure it'll be on PS five and we'll find out more. And new publisher too so it's kind of nice people will, will remember that evolve was published with 2k and that game went free to play because it was doing so badly so i think that wb is happy to take a little bit more time and i also think wb as we saw with their gotham game and justice league like they have nothing coming out so they have time yeah that's a good get for them number four there are some CD Projekt related pieces of news to report on and as an end, as I am sick of talking about this company and its games in any regard unrelated to possible legal remedies against it. We're putting it all into one item on the list. For starters, Cyberpunk 2077 has now been gone from PlayStation Store for more than three months, meaning it remains unavailable to purchase in any digital capacity there. People can still play hard copies and they are being updated, but the updates have apparently been bloated in size and underwhelming. In a conference call and presentation as reported on by many outlets, one member of the CD Projekt board noted, quote, we have published several patches. We have published a really big one yesterday. Every one of them brings us closer to getting that getting back to the store. The final decision belongs to Sony. So let's wait and see, end quote. Thankfully, they now promise to start. They now promise to start marketing their games much further out from launch, as opposed to uh, an important component to making investors happy since CD Projekt's market valuation has crumbled since Cyberpunk's launch, regardless of how well the game sold. Indeed, CD Projekt already has one of the generation's best selling games and still can't pay its investors dividends. One rep said, quote, we have learned many things from our marketing and PR campaigns for Cyberpunk 2077. Going forward, our campaigns will be much shorter. We'll wait until much closer to a game's launch before we start showing things like trailers, demos, or going in depth about mechanics, etc. End quote. As part of getting Cyberpunk 2077 in fighting shape more quickly, the developer slash publisher has abandoned its plan for, to have a larger standalone online Cyberpunk game. Quote, previously, we hinted that our next AAA game would be a multiplayer Cyberpunk game, but we have decided to reconsider this now. Given our new systematic and agile approach, instead of primarily focusing on one big online experience or game, we are focusing on bringing online into all of our franchises one day. End quote. This according to the studio CEO, Adam Kaczynski. As for the future, it sounds like The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt's port to PlayStation 5 will happen towards the end of this year, and that both the next Cyberpunk and Witcher games will be in development concurrent to one another, a questionable decision at best for a company who woefully mismanaged its last game. Yet, to buff out its, its staff size, a piece of information went largely unreported. CD Projekt purchased an outside studio, specifically the Canadian team DigitalScapes. DigitalScapes is a so-called co-developer that, coast, uh, that Ghost develops alongside bigger teams on bigger games in a silent capacity and worked with CD Projekt on Cyberpunk 2077. I felt more obligated than anything to bring that up. I have nothing more to say about these guys. Yeah. So I don't, <laughs> do, you, do you guys have anything to add? We'll talk yeah. about it when it's out again. Yeah, <laughs> that's where I'm at. I'm really tired of it, too. And I yeah, love I mean, it. I, I, I just don't want to. I mean, I brought it up because I, I don't think I, I don't make the news. I report it. 
Um, but I'm sick of talking about it. Yeah. Number five, word has it. Um, word has it. Number five, <laughs> word has it that Call of Duty is surprise, surprise, heading back to World War II in its newest incarnation. Word comes by way of Eurogamer, typically a very reliable source, corroborated its knowledge with another lesser known source, a website called Modern Warzone. The game will reportedly be called Call of Duty World War II Vanguard. And according to the latter source, quote, the entire game takes place in an alternate timeline where 1945 wasn't the end of World War II, unquote, and is instead set in the 1950s. However, Eurogamer's reporting totally conflicts with this report, saying that it isn't an alternate history or timeline take. Activision owned studio Sledgehammer founded in 2009 specifically to make Call of Duty games is apparently leading the charge on this project. You'll recall that following 2017's Call of Duty World War II, Sledgehammer's last full release, the studio was relegated to support status on Infinity Ward's Modern Warfare in 2019 and Treyarch and Raven's Black Ops Cold War in 2020. The team is apparently back in the driver's seat for 2021's Call of Duty iteration. So a lot of people are disappointed that it's going back to World War II, but it is true that this is only the second Call of Duty World War II game in 10 years. So it's not actually like an, an amazingly, you yeah. know, and, and the World at War was, I think, the one before that. So um, I'm not terribly disappointed in that. Chris, I'm wondering, though, whose rumor do you hope is true? The one that says it's a an alternate history game or the one that says that it's a real history game? <sighs> See... An alternate history would be interesting, but at the same time, an alternate history where, you know, World War II is still happening, I feel like, not that Wolfenstein already kind of is that, but like, I feel like it would... Well, the Nazis have won in Wolfenstein, essentially. Right, but like, I, I don't know, like, I don't know if I'd care that much to see Call of Duty do do alternate history, but at the same time, I don't really care that much about Call of Duty anyway. So, like, I feel like anything that they could do to be, like, even mildly interesting would be good. I I do think, though, that an alternate history would would kind of annoy people. Um, But maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe it wouldn't. Maybe they've gone so far from the Call of Duty that they used to be where they can just just do these, like, weird kind of offshoots. I I don't imagine Cold War is particularly accurate. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. Like, I think that if you, depending on how you interpret... um, the idea of alternate history, Black Ops and Cold War, or Black Ops rather, um, most recently with Cold War, is totally alternate history. So yeah, yeah, it's just a so, matter of it's a more obscure history, you know. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know. I, I guess it would be more interesting to see an alternate history. I, I don't like the name Vanguard though. I think that sucks. <laughs> it's really generic. What do you to me. Uh, think? What do you think, Dustin? What do you want? Would you rather see a straight up World War II game or a, or their alternate history take? I'm more interested in the alternate history, and I think that's just. It's we had a lot, a kind of a lot of World War Two. I guess not a lot. We had Battlefield One, which was World War One. So similar. It's not modern. We'll say which that. was awesome, by the way. Yeah, which was cool. It was the first. It was the first game that went back in the PS4 gen. I think the first, you know, big AAA. And then we had Call of Duty World War Two, and then we had Battlefield Five, which was World War Two. So we kind of got like boom, boom, boom. Um, older style uh, games for both of those franchises, which so I'm I'm leaning towards like I want to dude I want them to go f- full in. I don't want advanced or uh, you know infinite warfare. Like make me a Call of Duty with lasers and stuff. I don't know, like something totally different. But if I had to pick between the two, I like the alternate history I- idea. Um, Chris, I know you had brought up Wolfenstein, and that's actually like a pro for me if they can Mm -hmm. make a more crazy robot nazi call of duty game sure why not it'll be different for uh that franchise in particular no yeah definitely i this is unrelated but i i I, i'm disappointed that we haven't gotten a future battlefield game in like yeah what feels like centuries like it, it seems like it seems like ripe time for like a battlefield 21 20 something or you know but that's just me Hopefully I run this into existence. Just a couple of more to get through. Number six, there have been some notable happenings in the world of publisher and developer acquisitions. The smaller of the two deals is actually the one that will probably be more interesting to this audience, however. The Danish company Nordisk Film, which has a gaming subsidiary, has purchased 30.7% of British team Supermassive Games. 
Supermassive Games is best known to the PlayStation community for its 2015 PS4 exclusive teen horror game Until Dawn, though it actually developed quite a bit in the second party capacity for PlayStation from PlayStation Move games like 2010's Sackboy's Prehistoric Moves and a Little Big Planet 2 DLC in 2011 to the 2012 PlayStation 3 port of the original Killzone, 2016's PSVR launch game Until Dawn Rush of Blood, and 2018's PSVR game The Inpatient. However, they're also better known these days as being aligned with publisher Bandai Namco in an eight game deal under the so-called Dark Pictures Anthology. They've released two of those so far, 2019's Man of Madon and 2020's Little Hope, with House of Ashes following later this year. For its part, this isn't Nordisk's first foray into games. It outright owns Avalanche Studios' three team structure, responsible for the likes of Just Cause and Generation Zero. And it even owns a slice of Mercury Steam, the Spanish studio perhaps best known for its questionable Castlevania Lords of Shadow games between 2010 and 2014. The other piece of bigger news is that Nexon, a Japanese and South Korean games publisher with very little console or hardcore presence, now owns pieces of three substantial uh, video game publishers from Japan, Bandai Namco, Konami and Sega. As these companies are publicly traded, Nexon notes that these investments should be seen as, quote, friendly with no intention of acquisition or activism, end quote. I was thrilled to see that. Finally, a company that is not Chinese buying pieces of um, both of these pieces of news are great, by the way, uh, a, a not Tencent or some other um, shady and shadowy company, but instead a uh, a company that might have Western values and capitalistic values and not onerous and uh, shady dealings going on all around the world. So Nordisk now owns part of Supermassive and it looks like Nexon went on the market and bought many shares of Bandai Namco, Konami and Sega. They also bought a bunch of Hasbro, the owners of my beloved G.I. Joe. (laughs) Number seven, publisher Electronic Arts and its EA Sports brand has made a surprising announcement, particularly in light of recent news. It will be creating an EA Sports branded PGA Tour game. Why is this surprising? Well, EA's rival 2K and its 2K sports label not only purchased a team in the form of HB Studios that will be solely dedicated to its fledgling PGA Tour 2K series, but that beginning soon, it will be branded, as we reported, as Tiger Woods PGA Tour, complete with his endorsement. This is EA's old stomping ground, having produced an annual Tiger Woods PGA Tour game each and every year from 1998 until 2013. After briefly briefly giving the franchise to fellow golf star Rory McIlroy for a single launch in 2015, EA Sports has stayed away, but now they're re-engaged with the PGA Tour's license and blessing, making the golf game landscape perhaps the most competitive in sports gaming. So... I know this will go in one ear and out the other of many listeners, but if you're a fan just of the the business, golf is the only major sport where there is serious competition going on with the blessing of the licensor. So you'll note that NHL only has NHL uh, games. 2K is no longer exists, so they only have NHL games with the license. MLB The Show. There are mm-hmm. some smaller like RBI baseball, but only in the AAA space. NBA does have some competition with EA, but NBA 2K dominates that and so on and so forth. But you have the PGA Tour with two viable games now coming to the market after a lot of absence. And I'm very interested to see that develop. I'm not a big golf fan, obviously, but just as a, a fan of the business, I think it's very interesting that that's where they're going to do battle. Yeah. yeah. And Mario Golf, the most important licensed golf game. That is true. I can't wait. I can't wait. I'll actually buy Mario Golf when it comes out. Dude, I, love I, am, Mar- I love Mario one. Golf. I love it. Day one. The GameCube one is the best one. It was the 3DS one that was the disappointing one. That when that one came out and everyone was excited about it for a little oh, while, that one sucked. I hated that one. Yeah. Hated it. And finally, number eight is a wrap up. It's a long one. Developer ZeniMax Online, owned by Microsoft, has revealed that the Elder Scrolls Online is migrating natively to PlayStation 5 on June 8th. Miyoyo's mega popular free to play RPG Genshin Impact is also coming to PlayStation 5 natively, though at an unknown date. The official PlayStation blog reports old school style action game Smelter is coming to PS4 on April 22nd. Puzzle platformer Hoa is coming to both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 this July. And beer brewing simulator Brewmaster is coming to PS4 and PS5 at some point in 2022. That game sounds and looks really cool if people want it. I've never heard of a game like that, so that's. That's a nice change of pace. There's a PlayStation blog post about it. If you're interested, website Push Square reports Final Fantasy 14's open beta on PlayStation 5 begins April 13th. Voxel styled Earth Defense Force World Brothers is coming to PS4 on May 27th. That one's for Chris. Destruction oriented racer Wreckfest is coming to PS4 on June 1st. This is interesting because it has a rare $10 upcharge for those who already own it on PS4. So it is not free to go from one to the other. You have to pay 10 bucks to do so. It's very rare. 
in this market. Cycling Game Tour to France 2021 is coming to both PS4 and PS5 on June 3rd. Eagerly anticipated roguelike expansion The Binding of Isaac Repentance is coming to both PS4 and PS5 in the third quarter of 2021. Arcade Collection Arcade Paradise and Twin Stick Shooter Tiny Troopers Global Ops and XCOM-like game Fire Commander are all coming to PS4 and PS5 at an unknown time in 2021. 2D side-scrolling action game Savior is coming to PS4 at some point in 2022. And strategic hospital game War Hospital is coming to PlayStation 5 at some point in 2022. That game looks really good. The website like, likewise reports that narrative driven game Deliver Us the Moon will be getting a free PS4 to PS5 update at an unknown point this year. And Maneater, yes, will be getting a full expansion pack called Truth Quest also later this year. I'm all over that. Website Gamatsu reports fighting game Toho Hayuibana <laughs> Antimony of Common Flowers. Is coming to PS4 on April 22nd. Metroidvania Side Scroller, The Skylia Prophecy, and 2D action game Moon Raider are both coming to PlayStation 4 on April 23rd. Social Horror Game, which apparently is pretty popular on other platforms, Hello Neighbor, is coming to PS4 on April 29th. Mm -hmm. Survival Game Green Hell is coming to PlayStation 4 this June. Adventure Game Omno, Cooking Game Epic, che Epic Chef, and Cute Firefighting Game Ember are all coming to PS4 at some point this summer. Lemmings Clone Tin Hearts is coming to PS4 and PS5 this winter. Puzzler Lumote, side-scroller shooter Andros Dunos 2, fighting game Melty Blood type Lumenia are all coming to PS4 at some point, late, some point later in 2021. JRPG Astria Ascending, which looks great, it's from a bunch of Final Fantasy devs, is coming to both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 at some point later in 2021. New VR game Sam & Max, this time it's virtual, is coming to PlayStation VR in early 2022. Adventure game The Last Worker is coming to PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 at some point in 2022. Tactical RPG Lost Eidolons is coming to undetermined PlayStation consoles in 2022. And horror game Haunted Space has been revealed for PlayStation 5 to be released at an undetermined point. The website also reports that Koei Tecmo's two Atelier Riser J Riza JRPGs have surpassed 1 million units in combined sales. Well, that was a hefty one, huh? Again, we like to at least acknowledge every game coming to the platform at least once. Yeah. And so we have done that there. Now, as you guys know, tradition dictates that every episode of Sacred Symbols ends with six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience on Patreon at patreon.com slash Media. Please do support us over there for early ad-free access, exclusive episodes, uh, Discord access, and much more. Name in the credits, all sorts of things. Nicholas Jensen starts out and says, hey, Colin, Chris, and Dustin. I really enjoyed the latest episode of Sacred Symbols, especially the Six Days in Fallujah segment. It really got me wanting to start playing Call of Duty. I know that Six Days in Fallujah is not Call of Duty, but kind of similar, and I have never really been into shooters. So my question is this. What Call of Duty game would you guys recommend as my first? Old or new, thanks for all the hard work that you guys do. I don't know if he meant to rhyme, but it sounded kind of like an old B-boy thing from the 80s. <laughs> A little bit. Now, Chris, you're somewhat knowledgeable in Call of Duty in the shooter space, let's say, generally. Somewhat, uh, yeah. Um, I'm in, I'm knowledgeable about Call of Duty somewhat, and knowledgeable in the shooter space generally. Uh, Dustin, where do you where do you stand on Call of Duty? You like Call of Duty, right? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. oh yeah. Recently, the last two, I've I've put a considerable amount of hours. Into. Okay, so we all have our different takes here. Yeah. So, Chris, let's start with you. I mean, do you have a Call of Duty game or a different shooter? I mean, I appreciate Nicholas's want to play a Call of Duty game. I think that's a good series to play, but it sounds like he just wants to play a a good shooter. Uh, yeah. first person it sounds like so do you have any recommendations for him yeah you know i mean it's it's kind of old hat and stereotypical but i think call of duty 4 probably still holds up really really well um that's that's my personal favorite as far as like you know campaign and multiplayer it was before things started going off the rails but it was still like exciting enough to be like okay so this is like a, a worthy experience but honestly i'm gonna throw a bit of a throw a bit of a wrench here and say uh Medal of Honor Rising Sun is awesome, and if you have a, a way to play Medal of Honor Rising Sun or that's Frontline, on PS2, right? That's like old. Like I'm sure, yeah, I played I'm, that one. Sh I'm sure there's some way to play it, but I, that's I, the one in the that's the one in the Pacific, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that one, and I love but that I love that game more than I more than I like any Call of Duty game. But realistically, like if you're looking for a Call of Duty game, I would say like Call of Duty Four is probably like the the best one. Um, if you're, if, if you're, if the appeal of six days in Fallujah to you is, Hey, modern combat, Hey, uh, you know, modern warfare, real war type shit. If you're looking for like, just like a, an insane story that just happens to be like a first person game, 
I would say probably like the first Black Ops is pretty mind blowing and pretty cool. Um, but honestly, everything after that, uh, I can't say that I'm like the biggest, the biggest fan of uh, personally. I did like the earlier ones, like uh, Big Red One, and um, I think Call of Duty Three was okay from what I remember. It's been so long, and a lot that of was Treyarch's games, first one, I think. Right? I think so. Yeah. Well, no, because Treyarch did worked with High Voltage on on Big Red One. I, I think. Oh, okay. But. Yeah, those were the, those would be the the three that I would recommend. Obviously, Medal of Honor is like an older retro thing, so it might not be necessarily what you're looking for, but it's still a cool one. Dustin, what are your what are your recommendations for Nichols? I, I really do think that the most recent Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, as far as a multiplayer experience, is very good. Uh, I also really enjoyed the new Modern Warfare, and so uh, while I think that like. Call of Duty Black Ops 2 was my my jam when that came out. But I actually did go back and play that on Xbox backwards compatibility recently and it was uh, uh it's funny how your your brain modernizes an old game cuz I went back and I'm like, "Whoa, this is uh a little more dated looking than I remember." <laughs> but yeah. I'd recommend, you know, if you're trying to dip your toes, um one of the the two most recent ones are definitely going to be the most accessible yeah, to you to to check out and i think that they were both uh very good on the multiplayer front i i finished the modern warfare campaign and i thought it was pretty good i did not finish uh black ops cold war but i know that uh our very own mr matty plays thinks that the black ops cold war campaign is incredible Ooh. i uh the last call of duty game i played was modern warfare 2 remastered last year which i loved i oh. thought it was great and I love Call of Duty. I just haven't played in a few years now. I was looking at my trophies, actually. It's been a while but before that. But he's open to shooters. Like, it sounds like he doesn't really play shooters. So, again, it was what Chris was saying. Like, what is most attractive to you? Because, honestly, I would I would recommend you play, like, Borderlands or something. Like, or mm-hmm. if you want, if you're looking for a third-person shooter, play Spec Ops or Gears of War or something. I mean, if you, if my God, the world is your oyster. If you never played shooters, there's yeah, just so many there's good ones. So many incredible. I I, w- I was trying hard not to say Doom 2016 <laughs> or Doom or Doom yeah, Eternal, Doom. but maybe uh, not a good, maybe not the best games to jump into until you no, get no, no, until no. you get your wherewithal. But yeah, yeah. All right. Jeff Scott wrote in and said, "Hey guys, when games have a day-night cycle, do you have a preference on what time of day you play in?" Also, does that sync up with your own personal preference of when you like to be outside in real life? Dustin, let's start with you. What day night cycle? When do you like to play in your day night cycle? So, okay, I'm just I'm trying to think like, are we talking in game clock that's in sync with our our real world clock, like like Animal Crossing? Or are we saying I don't think so. I think we're talking about when a game has a day night cycle. Like fallout or something. Oh, um, you know, the definition of day night cycle. (laughs) <laughs> hold on now th- th- those games have a real <laughs> animal crossing is a real day night cycle it is real to our actual world which is often yes. very annoying which is a, yeah. what i was yeah. gonna say it's a terrible design decision i'm baffled that that it still works that way <laughs> right so i'm thinking specifically though it is an odd day night cycle with um either spider-man or spider-man miles morales um i always like it when it's when the sun is setting and like you'll be swinging through the uh through the the skyscrapers and the sun is perfectly like cascading down so um i guess i'll say uh dawn or early evening early evening okay and is that when you like to be outside in real life the most yeah probably actually like i know some people want to like get up and and go outside first thing get some fresh air i don't i find it like abrasive going outside first thing in the morning when it's either really bright or or whatever it's like it's too much i'd rather go out when things are winding down chris where do you stand on the day night cycle where do you like to play yeah i, th- I think uh, that's my answer too whenever i had the option to uh because i think in spider-man ps4 you had the option to choose like what time of day like you went to those like weird research stations and it would tell they would like give you a, a time of day to set and I, I always set it with sunset um because it's just golden hour just looks amazing mm. like all the time so like obviously it's going to be like just where graphics tend to shine where like art design tends to shine i like night as well like especially if it's if it's a game to where night is really night and you need like flashlights and shit i i love I love that. Uh, there's, it's not really super common. The only game that I can even think about 
that has a day night cycle that is true night um is state of decay 2 which like really it's so freaking dark and i wish more games did that because a lot of, i feel like a lot of games are like it's nighttime but we have so many pretty assets and we want you to see what we made right. so it's ostensibly just daytime but blue yeah like full um, moonlight all the time yeah, yeah and it's like nah man i want to i want to have to use and in those games you could choose to wait anyway like if i didn't want to play at night i would just click the wait button but typically like nighttime to sunset is is where i like to play and it is when i like to be out as well like i think whenever i would go into the city i would, I would always wait till it got like pretty dark and i'd be like yeah now's the time warriors so <laughs> although he technically says that in the morning so he does movie. so all right so i actually love day night cycles the the they're so i remember being so enchanted by castlevania 2s which was the first i had ever encountered and the nighttime in games always remind you know always brings danger and and uncertainty and death and loss and all that kind of stuff so i don't like playing at night like whenever i can avoid it i try to you know and fall out you know when you come out of a dungeon and it's like totally dark out and you're like oh shit and you gotta get gotta go to sleep or something so you can see what you're doing and the enemies aren't too powerful so but i, I like it. being outside at night so i will say that it doesn't quite sync up with me because i like to be out during the day in games but I'm outside every day now walking the dog multiple times, but I like being outside at night the most under the, the starry lit sky, the beautiful Milky Way romantic. galaxy. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's very romantic. It is. Yeah. Adam Stump wrote into us and said, Guten Tag, amigos. I have to say that Xbox is doing quite a bit, uh, quite a few things better than PlayStation, specifically cross save and backwards compatibility. Why are there so many steps to import my PS4 save to PS5? I have PS Plus and all my saves in the cloud, but for No Man's Sky, I had to download the PS4 version, upload the save, download PS5 version, and then I was able to download my save. If my save is already in the cloud, why do I have to go through the rigmarole of downloading the PS4 version of the game just to upload a save to the cloud that's already there? This and a few other things really need to be refined. Xbox just does these convenience features so much better. Thoughts? Thanks for cranking out. Awesome content. Have a great weekend. Thank you for writing in, Adam. Now, I'm I'm not experiencing this too much because I really only use I use the PS Plus plus cloud all the time, but I don't use in game clouds typically. But I'm reading a lot about this, that people are really annoyed about sending their saves between consoles and how much easier it is with Xbox. Yeah, no, I'll start with you, Chris. What, what, oh. are you, what are you seeing about about this or how do you feel about it? Well, it is definitely easier. Like I, I, I remember when I first encountered like the, the the cloud save thing for PlayStation, and I was kind of baffled that you needed to individually do that, because as far as I could remember, and maybe I just didn't transfer saves all that often, but as long as I could remember, my saves just sort of automatically would transfer whenever I would, whenever I was on Xbox. Like if I if I downloaded my profile on a friend's thing, it would just sort of automatically do it. Um, Obviously, barring any like anything that was like hard drive related, but I would say just the PlayStation ecosystem in general is is, is a bit inelegant in the way that it kind of operates, even just with the way that it, it distinguishes between PS4 and PS5 versions, um, which I think is like a little bit like arbitrary and weird because, you know, obviously Xbox just downloads the game and just figures out which version to play based on what what system you're running, which I think is just a better way of doing that. I don't know why you would want to even risk the chance of somebody buying a PS5 and accidentally starting the PS4 version and just being like, what did I pay this money for? I feel like that's just a very weird thing to open yourself up to. Um, but, you know, it's just because the the system works in a different way. Um, maybe it's smarter on some level. Maybe it isn't. I, I really have no idea. I, I just know that it is functionally, like when I'm using the two machines, I do find the convenience of of machines on the xbox side of things infinitely more accessible and infinitely more convenient than the way that things typically run on on uh, the playstation side which is you know, a little annoying i'll admit but not like not devastating it's not devastatingly hard to transfer your saves well i think it's it dustin to, to me because I, I hear what chris is saying like it's not a huge deal but what we keep complaining about with playstation 5 is just that there's just one or two extra moves required for everything and yeah gestures and the trophies are not right like someone had written in saying which is was like the way you see the old trophy list is you have to go and compare your trophies with someone then you can use that list and see like the old list and it's like man what the fuck is going on so what how do you feel about this dustin about the extra hoops and and all of this 
So from my understanding on a technical aspect, it has to do with the fact that Xbox apps are more updatable. And so they're able to use the same save file. Um, whereas for PlayStation, you have to create an entirely new application that is a PS5 application. PS5 applications can't read your PS4 save data. So he's asking about why does he have to download the PS4 version is because No Man's Sky basically built a tool into their game that will convert your save into a PS5 save. And so they'll put it up in their cloud so that when you get on your PS5 version of the app, you are downloading the converted file, which this is a big issue for certain games. For example, to my understanding, Yakuza Like a Dragon has no save transfer feature. They have not created a tool that will rework your save and then upload it as a PS5 save. So this is definitely an area where Xbox is is clearly uh, their infrastructure is just much better for that kind of support. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting because it like it, it wouldn't in, in a normal transitionary cycle. I feel like it wouldn't have mattered that much because we would be kind of already in the area where we're getting next gen exclusive games only. So this mm-hmm. issue wouldn't be an issue, but now that, you know, conceivably the next year or two of releases are going to be PS4 and PS5, right? it's only it goes, exacerbating the, the inconvenience of it. It goes beyond saves, too. In fact, there's kind of a, a, a problem right now in the Call of Duty community where Warzone on Series X can run at 120 FPS, but it doesn't on P on the, the PS4 version playing on PS5 because there's limits in the PS4. However, they make that, you know, their the how they wrap their game, whatever. Uh, they just simply cannot run at 120 FPS. They must be fully updated to PlayStation 5. So that's a huge advantage for Xbox when you're looking at Warzone. Um, you know, it's just yeah. a huge one of the biggest uh, free to play games. It just simply runs better. You're going to have a competitive advantage on Series X if you play Warzone at 120 FPS. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you bring this up, by the way, because we were going to talk about FPS next. Oh, Cedric S wrote in and said, hey, CDC, I got to take Colin to the mat on something. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you want to. You little fucking pervert. <laughs> I often hear you saying that Sony needs to justify the purchase of the PS5 by making games for it and not leaning on PS4 games. Even going as far as saying, quote, there's not really a reason to buy one just yet, end quote. In my opinion, that's not fair for one big reason, frame rate. I don't think you're taking into consideration that many PS4 games benefit greatly from being on PS5 because of the more stable frame rate, 60 or 30 frames locked. Games like Control, Arkham Knight, and Days Gone, for example. Some games like Just Cause 4 are damn near unplayable on PS4 because of the unstable frame rate, because of all the explosions and everything going on at once. Not to mention the improved load times on Red Dead Redemption 2 and Rage 2. You have a PS4 Pro and don't have nearly as many problems as some of, us, some of us with a slimmer base model PS4 and didn't upgrade to the Pro. So cut us former PS4 slim owner some slack, will you? Buying a PS5 allows me to finally play those games the way they were meant to be played. Thanks, guys. Now, my only my only retort to this is that the games were meant to be played on the hardware that they were released on. So this is great. I mean, this is a huge benefit. benefit uh, we're all benefactors of PlayStation 5 through the frame rate boost that we're getting. And I've said many times and we talked on the show that I've become a bit of a frame rate noticer for the first time in my life, like really noticing it and mm-hmm. being like, I want more. But let's just definitively because this keeps coming up. I want to definitively make a statement one way or the other. I'll let you guys explain. But Chris, does PlayStation 5's purchase or, or is frame rate alone a justifier, let's say, for PlayStation 5? My answer to this is no. You know, like, no, it isn't. It's not. They need games still. So that's my state, my stance, even though I'm a believer and, and a benefactor of the frame rate issue. I still feel like it's not justifiable. What do you say, Chris? I would say I, I don't I don't disagree necessarily. Like, obviously, if you're going to spend five hundred dollars on something, it's got to do more than just offer you a better frame rate. But at the same time, I I am on the PC side as well, where I will spend a hilarious amount of money purely to do that exact thing and really nothing, really nothing else. So I, I think you could argue that some people for a lot of people, yeah, it might be enough, but I, I would argue that the majority of people don't even understand that that's a thing that they want yet. Um, you know, like I, I think the majority of people who play video games 
especially now that it's become like super, super accessible. I, I don't even think the word frame rate is necessarily in their vocabulary uh, in the same way that it is for us. So as far as like something that like, hey, you need to drop five hundred dollars. So on this casual console that is impossible to find uh, just so you can play Days Gone at like a frame rate that doesn't physically make you ill. Uh, I don't know if that's reason enough to buy a new machine that is going to probably cost you like, um, you're probably gonna have to sell your kidney to get it at, the, at this point on the black market. But at the same time, I would say, I think a boost in frame rate is a, is it is a good enough reason to invest in new hardware, you know? And I know that's probably sounds contradictory and it probably is, but you know, I, I think the PS5 needing to justify itself with with worthwhile titles and um, something being a, a worthwhile purchase because it boosts the the um, the performance of everything that you own are both reasonable kind of issues to be raised. Yeah, he, spe- he specifically does say, and I think it's a fair point, Cedric, that he's jumping from a slim or, or base model. People oh, are yeah. jumping from pro like all of us on the show have a different experience but so i i I think that's a point well taken but dustin where where are you on this uh, situation that's actually what i wanted to focus on is that uh one of my very best friends brandon he he had a base ps4 and he while he plays a lot of the the big games he puts a lot of time into warzone and i've seen warzone running on his base ps4 and it is not pretty between the low resolution the crappy frame rate the horrible load times the crashes and so he has a ps5 he's played you know some ps5 games but he's probably put more time in warzone on ps5 than i have on all the time that i've spent on my ps5 because he's like a consistent every night player and so for him like Yeah, it's completely justified because the experience that he was having on that base PS4 was was not good. And that's what he was desiring out of the system. So I don't know. I feel like maybe we've been a broken record saying this before, but the value is in the eye of the beholder on what you want from the device. Definitely. Yeah. That is. Does he notice like has he know has he said anything like, oh, wow, it's so much better. Well, it's simply in the fact that it's not crashing three times a night <laughs> is, is first. I mean, the big thing. Right, yeah. Um, but again, like because uh, some people don't know. notice and that's what's baffling. To, like some people yeah. like I, I've shown like I showed my um, my my parents like Demon Souls, you know, and right. it just looks so freaking real. And like, you know what I mean? Like, it's such an impressive looking game. And they were like, yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. Does it, you, right. you, you, this looks better than everything that surrounds it in our real life right now. Like, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's insane, you people. But I, uh, I had an experience like that where uh, Holly's dad is really into Western movies. And so when Red Dead Redemption 2 came out, they were at our house. I was like, I got to show you this game. Look at how cool this is. And he was like, oh, yeah, it is like a Western. But it, it was like, it just kind of was like, that's neat. That's yeah, a neat toy you just, got there, yeah, Dustin. It's, yeah, it's like they don't give a fuck. There's just some, yeah. a lot of people that just don't care. There's yeah, nothing yeah. you're going to be able to do for them. So, all right, let's do two more. Levi Bordet wrote into us and said, greetings, Colin and reformed communist Chris. My <laughs> girlfriend recently told me that she'd like to begin playing some couch co-op games with me. This would normally be cause for celebration. The only problem being that the few games we have played have ended with me entering a deep simmering rage due to her not being able to grasp concepts such as camera control and her overall lack of any recognizable skill in even the most basic of games. While she is attempting to have a good time, I'm attempting to keep my shit together. Starting this co-op journey with Overcooked probably didn't help, followed shortly by Dead Nation. What? (laughs) What? I thought I'd turn to the foremost love gurus for any advice on how to overcome this hurdle. Am I alone in my inability to deal with teaching someone a game while we attempt to play it? Am I too competitive a gamer? All right. So Dead Nation is really hard. So I don't think your your girlfriend's even going to understand Dead Nation. I think that was a weird one for you to pick, Levi, with all due respect. I like your dedication to Housemark. I appreciate that. But I don't think that that's a that's one that you want to pull out with your girlfriend or your wife necessarily. Now, I wanted to say real quick. I'm so grateful for the first time in my life to be dating a a gamer, which I never did in my life. And with my ex, we couldn't play exes. We couldn't play games because 
I remember playing Overcooked with my ex and I wanted to like kill myself. So I, I totally understand what Levi's saying because you have to you have to have a certain understanding of how games are played and all of that. And I think Levi, I mean, my advice is like maybe what's best for your girlfriend is to sit down by herself and play some games yeah. so she can understand the way things work and how much controls segue from one to the next. I mean, even finding something is incidental or not is like if you invert is a really important step in understanding how a game controls and removing maybe her own frustration too. overcooked is notorious for driving people <laughs> apart. I mean, that's a notorious <laughs> game. Like it's a, that's what's so funny about it. It gets people infuriated at each other. I love that you wanted to play dead nation with her. I don't know what made you think she was going to be able to play a fucking twin stick shooter, but, um, <laughs> I don't know. So, Chris, what do you what do you think? I mean, my my take here is like maybe she'd like something like I know it takes two is getting a lot of rave reviews and a way out from the same studio and all of that. But I, I still feel like sit her down and like let her play some of your games without mm-hmm. you. You don't need to play with her. And maybe she'll take to what she takes to and maybe she'll learn one of two things, either what she wants to play with you or maybe even better is that she doesn't need you to play. And I don't mean that in a sexual way. Yeah, Chris. No, I, I agree. I, th- I think I, I don't think you can teach somebody how to pl- like when I learned how to play video games. Um, the thing that got me the itch to learn was was playing with uh, my sister and playing with my cousins. But like I didn't learn with them. Like I, I, I had to spend time on my own, like playing games that I wanted to play by myself to really like grab because otherwise you're just playing like y- y- you feel like you're competing with other people and y- you want to give yourself room to kind of right. experiment and breathe because you don't right. want to feel like you're holding anybody up or, or like you're like oh man i can't figure this out but like oh, whatever like you're not going to be in a learning mood if, if you're if you're playing cooperatively or, or competitively with people around you so i think um i i think the best way to go about it is really start her off any and this goes for anybody learning how to play video games start off 2d start mm. off with something 2d start off with something simple just to, to get the basics like up down left right Camera controls can be learned way later after after people learn what button inputs do and like what that's even for. Like, because once you have that base understanding, you can just extend that to what the sticks do and how, and how the sticks are placed and and you know extend that to the triggers. But you want to keep something simple. Like I would say, even something like if you have a Switch, play some of the older Mario games, like genuinely, or like something like Donkey Kong Country, like or like something old, but something that is still playable still really good uh still runs well or even th- there's a bunch of like retro stuff now that although i know a lot of the recent retro stuff is kind of marketed on how hard it is and how challenging it is i'm sure there's some other uh game that is is 2d that you think that she could grasp and she could learn on her own and and then you can start moving on to like you know a third person game and i don't know what that game would be i'm i'm, I'm noticeably less experienced with the uh, you know, simple third person games, but that's the progression. I think you can't just start somebody off <laughs> in something like overcooked or something like dead nation, which is like hard. Uh, you gotta, you gotta start soft with like 2d and then eventually move on to 3d where, totally camera, agree. where camera becomes like a bigger component because cameras are the thing that fucks everybody up. Yeah. Like I definitely. tried to teach my mom portal. Like when I was a kid, I didn't, I had no understanding. I was like, this is simple. It's not competitive. You know, that's what, that's what my brain was. And she was like looking at the ceiling and never took her eyes off it because she didn't understand what the stick was or even like what was in front of her or what was being represented. And right. I tried to teach my mom that too. Like just the idea of like spatial one moves you right. And one moves your, your visual like space, right? Like one is your locomotion one is what you're looking at. It's t- it's very hard to communicate. It's that. it's it's wildly hard for people to grasp. It, it, it's we take for granted how hard some of this stuff can be to learn, because like obviously we've been doing this forever. Like I learned basic camera controls in like the '90s, and I'm yeah. You just learned young. it without even. I don't even remember how or when I learned any of this stuff. It's just it's just innate for yeah. sure. Right. Dustin, what do you think about? Well, yeah, I was wondering what you think about. Uh, I mean, I think Chris kind of nailed it. I, I really feel like it's like you got to learn how to add and subtract before you, uh, yeah. you know, multiply and divide kind of thing. Got to crawl before you can walk, man. Right. You can't just start somebody off with fucking demon souls. <laughs> right. <laughs> my girlfriend yeah. didn't understand how to leave messages in demon souls. And now we broke up. <laughs> yeah. My recommendation just for a specific game that you might want to try, like we were saying, like Overcooked is Overcooked is going to test the strongest of relationships, Definitely. especially someone who doesn't know how to play games. Try something low key, like uh, 
I think Stardew Valley has co-op, and that's going to be a very relaxing experience. You want it to be a positive experience. And so just, you know, hang out, build a farm. Where are my maybe, crops? Yeah. 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 Where are my crops, woman? So you could do that. You could do Minecraft. Maybe yeah, Minecraft, when, yeah. yeah. Main, after, after that might be a little harder because it is still first person, but like one other thing, um, I don't know how much sometimes people don't want to be a like passive engager in the fact that like they want to also have a controller in their hand one of the most valuable uh and cherished co-op memories i have playing with holly is playing through all three danganronpa games um which i was i was the one driving on the controller but we we had an amazing time um like we would play and then we'd eat dinner and the whole time we'd be discussing like okay who who did the murder who what do you think is going to happen and so definitely yeah. yeah, real fucking nerd, nerdy yeah, that's shit some going nerd on. Nerd shit in my right house. there. I'll tell you what. Uh, no, it's good. I mean, this is all good advice. I, I think just having an interested spouse or a significant other in video games is great. And I mean, I never understood how how awesome that was until Micah and I sat down when we started dating and played Streets of Rage Four. And it wasn't. It's just never even been a check mark in my mind of like playing games with someone else or having that option and like and then like I couldn't imagine when one of my exes playing streets, streets of rage you know and then like and then she just we just beat it in one sitting like she didn't need to learn anything you know I was like oh this, that sounds nice. that sounds pretty nice yeah I, I will say something yeah. just came to mind limbo is great oh limbo is really yeah. great it's simple it's short it's uh very aesthetically easy on the eyes I think it's uh I think that's a good game to start honestly Shows you the possibility of the uh, the possibilities of game narrative as well yeah. and design and physics. Just like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of complicated things in that game that aren't hard to grasp at all. Yeah, it's a great game and inside as well. Mm-hmm. All right, finally, Armbar Mitzvah, which I think is a great name, wrote in, says hello, hello, symbolic ones. I recently saw that Ghost of Tsushima hit 6.5 million copies, which I assume means it's a hit. The Last of Us 2 was at 13.5 million last I saw. Then I see reports like Dead Cells hit 5 million copies, and I think it was newsworthy that Sekiro hit 2 million a while back. All this tells me I have no idea how these metrics work. So I shall ask the experts. Obviously, a good metric for success is making a profit, but what really determines a hit? Is it based on the cost of making the game, sales compared to a studio's previous efforts? What are the factors that go into defining a title sales expectations? Thanks for the plethora of hours of entertainment whilst we are stuck in this viral hellscape. You're welcome, Armbar Bits, bar, arm bar Mitzvah. Thank you for writing in. So this is a great question. And the answer, you kind of answer it yourself. I mean, obviously, the metrics are, are sliding, but the general metric of success in the gaming industry, apart from critical success, which was which is its own thing, is how much did you make on when you made the game? No one wants to break even. No one wants to lose money. So the more successful a game uh, will the more successful games will make you and net you more money. My assumption is, is that the Ghost of, Ghost of Tsushima being at 6.5 million copies is notable on its own, but also notable because it had to be notable at the time they announced that, which was when they announced the film. While we see something like The Last of Us Part Two, which cost way more money, frankly, to make than Ghost of Tsushima and had way more riding on it. I think that The Last of Us Part Two would have been a, an, an abject failure at five or six million copies sold. Uh, meanwhile, Ghost of Tsushima is a new IP. So you have to look at it like that. Dead Cells is a massive hit at five million copies because twin uh, motion twin the studio is a co-op owned employee owned studio meaning that i think there's 12 of them and they're all millionaires now yeah. everybody so, everybody at that studio is really happy <laughs> so that's but five million copies for them and five million copies for treyarch are two different things so you have to like look at it based on that if, if we sold five million copies at lilymo you'd never see me again <laughs> ever i'd be gone so book uh, it so i don't there's I'm, I'm sorry if the answer is not quite as satisfying but you really do have, it, it is sliding we saw so for instance i think we're at like twenty thousand copies sold a twin breaker that's like a huge success for us i mean but if uh sony sold twenty thousand copies of a game they'd want to murder themselves you know yeah. it would be it would be over for them for whoever greenlit that game for whoever produced it for whoever marketed it, everyone would be gone yeah if a game if sold the last of us two sold twenty five thousand <laughs> copies <laughs> the world would have been burning so so metric success it's a great question metric success is based on different things for different studios and for and and like you said sekiro at two million was a hit because it's a new ip it's obscure it's competing in a soulsborne f- 
uh, Soulsborne ecosystem where the IP can't be used for that game, but everyone kind of identifies it, but they're also kind of tired of it a little bit. You know, it only attracts the more hardcore audience and Demon Souls remake was right on the around the corner. All this. So there's a lot of different things that you have to kind of take into account. Yeah. Critical hits and measuring critical hit and critical success way, way easier. And I would think generally an eight or above is considered a critical success in the industry. Um, yeah. The green space, the green zone, as you might call it on Metacritic. And, yeah, um, I, I think um, I also just think this is just like a basic rule of life that everything varies person to person. Like if I got a if I had a video that hit like, um, you know, two million views in like a day, you know, that's a massive success for me. But if if, you know, the newest trailer for like some big budget movie gets that many views in like a week's time. Like, it's probably not that great. <laughs> you probably want, like, more eyes on it. Um, you know, so everything's on a sliding scale based on, like, what your own, like, what your own output is, what your what your uh, history says, like, what your your predictive metrics say. Hmm. You know, it's hmm. this is just universally true. This is, has it almost has nothing to do with video games, you know, right. this, this premise. The only thing that I would add, just as an interesting thought, is um, it also has to do with the company and their their other products, kind of like what you said with PlayStation. But I was thinking in particular, people always are like, "Why aren't we seeing more Metroid?" You know, I'm sure that more recent, like Metroid Prime, I don't think we have actual numbers. I'm seeing uh, VG charts, which isn't that notoriously not. Yeah, those numbers are made accurate. up. Yeah, yeah, I hate VG charts. But let's just all let's my just, homies hate VG charts. Yeah, yeah. Let's just as a thought experiment. <laughs> let's say they're right. <laughs> Right. Uh, Metroid Prime, 2.8 million um, for Nintendo, 2.8 million. No, it's not, not a success. I'm pretty sure the entire Metroid franchise is sub 20 million combined. Yeah. Just to yeah. put it into context. I mean, which is nuts. I think it's right. more important to the industry than it is as a uh, as an actual franchise. Oh, definitely. Honestly, Super Metroid was iconic for a lot of people. And obviously Metroid Prime was awesome. But. And and it's important to note that Nintendo was thrilled with selling three million copies back then, but they don't want to do that anymore. So right. um, that's probably why they rebooted Metroid Prime Four. Right, exactly. I mean, we don't even really know what Retro has been up to for a while, yeah. right? So it's been a long time. But I'm not going to speak on Nintendo. Everyone gets mad when I talk about Nintendo. All right, boys, let's get the hell out of here. It's time to go. Chris, do you have any closing comments? Uh, I'm going to eat uh, a calzone now Ooh, that I've been. I've been. Ex- boy, I've been what are you going to get I've in it? Oh my God. I don't know yet. I, I'm going to go to this uh, place that I always go to. Uh, I haven't gotten to Calzone there in like years. I got an empanada this morning with like mm. this much beef in it. Oh. And the and the shell was this big. I wanted to kill myself. Yeah, it's not going to do. No, you got to go with a different oh. ethnic food and see what happens. So yeah, let I us know how the Calzone is next time. I got to go with a different cocooned right. beast. Right. Know? Well, that sounds good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, may I recommend humbly sausage and uh, onion? That's always oh. my favorite Calzone. I'll keep that in oh. mind. Dustin. Do you have any closing comments? No, just, uh, you know, I'm going to, I think we're getting Thai food tonight. Ooh. And then I have to set up a bed frame because as, uh, as Chris somewhat recommended a few weeks ago, I splurged on a bed and it's coming tomorrow. Awesome. Did I got to get, did, did, oh, go ahead, Chris. I'll let did you do I, it. Did I recommend that? <laughs> what did I well, say? You, I, there was the line where you said, oh, if you buy a bed, you should really, that's a, ble, a bed is something you want to splurge on. Yeah. That's what I was, that made fun oh. of you for saying that you wanted to. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. I indeed I got a, a purple mattress. Oh, that's coming tomorrow. I'm very excited, and I yeah. hope that my back will be excited as well. But yeah, we'll it's hard to get good sleep, man. Like I'm always uncomfortable. I'm Me too. always yeah. uncomfortable. I don't know. Like I'm just never yeah comfortable. It's very I, frustrating. I understand that. I'm uncomfortable as hell right now. <laughs> All right, let's get that hell out of here. Thank you so much for your love, kindness, and support of our show. Leave us nice reviews on iTunes and elsewhere. Give us a thumbs up and a subscribe on YouTube if you watch it there. Support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Buy our merch, laststandmedia.shop. And for God's sake, stop touching yourselves because God is watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Don't don't take too much care. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Central Virginia and Burbank, California, USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Ragon Maldonado. 
Sacred Symbols executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 